that time was uh, I first went on the farm with Jack Hayward. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You gonna start? Yes. All right. Yes. Yes. Well, um, Jack Hayward is poking about Billy Nudgel. Couldn't find work. And he asked me, would I see Pip and get that farm of his? And uh, we'd run it in the half shares. I took that and he worked it along pretty well while I was with him. And after a time there, I don't know how long now, but uh, he had another bright idea that if he could get the farm, he'd marry May. Right. Yeah. So I said, OK. So I got the farm for him. And they went there, and they couldn't get along. They, um, oh, he discontented. He used to go shooting birds and fooling around instead of doing any work. And Pip had fed up with him, and I was a bit disgusted because it let me down. Yeah. And um, I don't know how long they stopped there, but they left anyway, and I think they went over to Mullumbimby. And uh, in the meantime, uh, Mother and father shipped over there and bought the house. And uh, they bought the house and then Dad uh, got this stroke. I think it was in April. I can tell you the exact date. I think I got it over home somewhere. Yeah. He got this stroke and uh, I was working, I was still working, building that little something. I don't know what. And I went, anyhow, I went and lived with his mother for uh, such time as things happened, you know. And um, let me see now. Yeah, I, stay, I stayed there anyway from April to October. At this first session, yeah. and Dad died on the uh, early October. I just forget the exact date. And uh, I still stayed as Mum then for such time as uh, she settled down after Dad's death. You know. Yes. Yeah. And uh, May came and lived with her then. But in the meantime, while well, I was with Mum there, I didn't have any money except for some money I used to switch firewood for weavers, the name of the people, down the uh, Brunswick Road there. I got 10 shillings for a spring cart load of wood and I'd work from about early in the morning till about 2 o'clock in the day and I'd go back to Mullumbimby and help with the mother with dad, rolled him over in bed to rub his back with methylated spirits and stuff like that, so yeah. stop him getting bed sores. Yeah. And then he finally died. And uh, May came to live with May, as I said before. And uh, I didn't have much to do. So I decided, I thought about buying this store. I'd known it pretty well. I'd helped a uh, chap that was in it, Peter Elephant, off and on there different times, you know, just pottering around. I had a fair idea how to run it, so I borrowed some money off Mum and I bought it. And uh, shortly after that, uh, we got married, Ada and I. Yeah, ma your mother came over there to work for... Um, well, that's it, working at... Uh, was Wayne's, I owned a store. Wayne's? Wayne's, yes. I think I told you pointing before, but it was Wayne's. Uh-huh. A uh, pair of pommies. And... Um, we went a bit downhill with, with bad debts, and in the meantime, I got jobs. So I laid a wind mind to the shop. I went out working, and uh, I remember uh, next door Wayne's out of some relative who come out from England, a pommy bloke, Alf uh, Newman. He's a fine chap too. I'll admit that young fella. Uh -huh. And uh, his painted po pointing had a heap of old paint in the shop. And he decided Wayne wanted to get rid of it, and he uh, had a bright idea that we'd uh, take on some house painting. So he and I went high painting houses. <laughs> yeah. So we uh, painted one house out at uh, Yelgan, uh, belonged to old Petrovic, as his name was. We yeah. painted his house. We used to ride a motorbike. He had an old motorbike, and I used to sit on behind. <laughs> no fancy seats, just to carrier sort of was there at the back and I used to sit behind it in the cushion or something and with a vibration traveling along the road, old uh, gravel roads 
you know, back at, I mean, back used to get numb. <laughs> <laughs> and anyhow, we painted his house and went back. And uh, he that delighted with the job afterwards. He produced a bottle of wine the day we left. Yeah. And we drank it. And I thought, well, we're going to have some fun getting home today. But anyhow, I got on behind him. He had to write a, a plank of ours about 18 inches wide over a creek. Yeah. And he said, will I have a go at it or will I not? And I said, I've go. We <laughs> rode over this plank and got home safely. <laughs> <laughs> After that, anyway, we went and we painted another house for an old chap called uh, Jarvis. I'll just straighten this up there. Yeah. Yeah. An yeah. old chap called Jarvis and his wife. Yeah. And uh, we're starting to run out of paint to finish. He using all his paint, you know. And Alf said to me, he said, I'm not going to buy any more paint. He said, we'll make this do. <laughs> and he went and raided the kerosene tin of Jarvis and put kerosene in the paint. <laughs> the last little bit. <laughs> Anyhow, he finished that and he paid us. And later on, Ben used to go around there with the, getting orders for the uh, for, for Wayne, you know, yeah. had a delivery cart that time. And uh, old Jarvis told him, he said, I don't know, he said, I made a good job of this painting, he said, except for that western wall, he said, it dried out very fast. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been the timber was very dry or something. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he got away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I used to go out too, and I, I got the uh, pockets there. I know I split post for Tom Torrens up there, and or some pommy people, I forget their name. And uh, I know the old times I used to go up there and I'd start work very early in the morning. I'd knock off about three o'clock in the day, it's that early. Mm -hmm. But I made the rains with the old times because I used to like to get the job done and get back, you know. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, turn it off a minute. All right. Uh, I think. Yeah. Um, being sometimes for a good price in the winter, because we could grow them up there when they couldn't get any down around Sydney, around Hawkesbury, for instance, see yeah. across. So um, this Alf Newman and I, we went in the, uh, there's a patch of bananas out that's what they refer to as pinch cut. You go down your right and road and you turn to your left to go back up in the hills to your left. And there's a patch of bananas there we got off a chap, young bananas, and we planted beans. Oh. Uh, Pinch cut. Right. Uh, yes, we put in these beans. He, uh, which we done? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yes, um, we put in these beans, we put in a bushel of beans. And they did pretty well. And we picked a ton and a quarter in one picking. <laughs> uh, beautiful beans. Mm. Um, the kerosene is 11 inches across, and uh, the width of the kerosene is 11 inches, some of them, that big. But anyway, we picked the, these beans. At, uh, we only got to one pick. They got a complaint called that we had some showery weather, and they got bacterial blight, and it swept through the lot and cleaned them all out. You couldn't pick really? them Really? What, they go sort of, they change colour or? Oh, no, it's, a, die off. it's a bacterial disease, like a, a spot, and it spreads over them, and ruined. It's a bacteria. Mm. And I never found a cure for it at that time either. But anyway, we, um, when we picked the beans, we had to cart them on our backs, carry them in bags about a half a mile, a good half mile, before we get them onto some vehicle to cart them away. Mm. But uh, anyway, there's others there besides us with beans. There's Clary Plate on our here to patch. Yeah. And uh, a chap called Jim Jarrett had a patch of bananas there beyond, beyond them, and he had bana uh, beans in too. He had a wire net the whole lot to keep out the wallabies. While I'm on this, uh, Jimmy Jarrett, I know um, a wallaby got into his patch one night and ate a lot of his beans, and he got up in the morning and he was furious. And he chased this wallaby round and round the enclosure, trying to catch it, and he's trying to dive at it and make a dive and tackle it like a football yeah. and tackle him. <laughs> <laughs> when did he kill this head laughing, you know? And, and uh, anyhow, finally, the old wallaby jumped the fence and got away. Yeah. And I remember Clary Plater, he used to get his wife and friends out to help pick beans, and I was hard in their back, you know. Yeah. 
And before he got them out, he said to us, he said, you don't complain about the backs. He said, you complain, we'll complain about our anchors and, and uh, feet giving way. Huh? Get off the subject of bad backs. <laughs> and they couldn't understand why we all had bad, <laughs> bad anchors and had bad backs. <laughs> 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 but uh, anyway, we uh, finished and we didn't uh, make much money for the simple reason that uh, I'm sure the agents down in Sydney robbed us. Yeah. Because uh, this chap we are talking to last night about Grierson, Dave Grierson, he, he's at the markets when these bees were sold. Ah. And uh, they brought uh, not, much, not, uh, not much of a price, you know. And the chap asked him how much would the would the growers get? He said all the growers get a headache. Yeah. Oh, Grierson said this. Yeah. We didn't make much out of it. Still, we made something. And that was the time one of this poor old Jack Cupper, a black fellow there, living in a hollow stump, a burnt out stump. He put some sheets of tin over the top, and that's where he camped in this burnt out stump. <laughs> and uh, he put in his patch of beans. And he never picked a bean because there was a uh, garner sheed by some people up at Chindra that he owed money to. They come and garden and sheed and he never got a bean, never got a shilling out of it. Yeah. Yeah. But on the bean racket, uh, later on... That's uh, where it was, right? The bloke, um, we had a couple of stories going about the That's Aboriginal living... Oh, yes, and I think I was finished up with about Mr. Grierson, didn't I? Being at the market. Yes. Yeah. Talks about him. Yeah. And then we um, we moved on. Uh, there was a story about Garrett or Jarrett. Eh? Who was the fellow? The other fellow that had the beans. Oh, new one. No, Jarrett. Didn't oh, Jarrett. Him? Yeah. Oh yes, I mentioned to talk about him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, um, the wallaby jumped the fence finally and got away. Yes. And then I, was, I mentioned about uh, Clary played to bring in his wife and some other women. Oh, had that's right, in the ankles. I think we got that, didn't we? Yes, we did. And um, mm. yes, we never made much man out of that. But after that, uh, before uh, Alf Newman, he went down to Victoria later on. But he, we planted a patch of beans. Uh, up uh, the railway line from Billy Nuddle, up past the tunnel where we used to live, on on Fifth Farm, oh, yeah. on the side of the hill there. Mm -hmm. And I know we had difficulty getting the netting. We had to get the netting to net it in, you see, to keep the animals out. And uh, it was very awkward to take them up by road. And we woke up the idea there's a, a bridge gang, railway bridge gang. Billy knows at that time, we asked him about getting one of the flat tops and putting a netting on it and pushing it up the railway line through the tunnel and then load it to the other side where we could get hold of it very conveniently. Yes. And he wasn't very keen on this. And he did finally agree to let us have it. So one day we got it and we took the netting up and he, oh, by the way, he said in the first place, he said, I want you to get off the line as soon as possible. He said, you never know what's going to happen. That's right. So anyhow, we, uh, we pushed the netting up there, unloaded, and just got back to the railway station at Billy Nudgel and, and took it off the line when a, an engine came in. We heard it was a light engine going up to Woolambar. Yeah. If we had five minutes, it would have copped us. Yeah. Yeah, it would have run us down. It was an unscheduled train. Yeah, no, yes. Just this light engine to pick up a train, I don't know why. Yeah. We damn near got caught with it. But anyhow, after Alf, uh, Ralph left, later on, I planted beans at um, Child O'Donnell, up the top end of the pocket, when we were living in Brighton, this was. And uh, the westerly winds killed all them. <laughs> and uh, then uh, the following year, I put in beans out at Yelgan, some people called Johnson. Uh, Bill Johnson said I could have a patch of young bananas he had and put in beans there. So I netted all it in. And uh, I put in a, a different kind of bean there, that resistant to bacterial blight, called Feltham Prolific, I remember the name of it. 
And they didn't go real well, but still there were beans there. And I went out one day and bugger me if the Brahmin wallabies hadn't got in and cleaned all them up. <laughs> oh, so I got shit. nothing out of that either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I finished up with the beans at that time anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was you were, I think you were going to say something else about the beans. Was it... Oh, that was the continuation of that story that, that yeah. you had about those beans. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, um, that's when we were in the shop, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, well, after time I found out the shop wasn't paying with bad debts. I decided I'd have to sell. Yes. And uh, Mrs. Williams bought the place. She got a bank manager out in Bolombimi to check all the books and that. And he told me that the books for a shop of that size are the best he's ever seen. Yeah. So I do pat myself on the back. Yeah. Anyway, she bought the place. And uh, the few uh, bit of money I had left, about £10, I think I paid it all away trying to settle up all my bills, newspaper and so forth. Yes. And um, I decided to build a sort of a shack to live in like they do these days to live a bit cheaply. Yes. So I, uh, I cut poles about 12 or 15 feet long and I dragged them to the site where I was going to put up the place with bullocks and I borrowed a, bo a block and tackle and rigged a mast and lifted them into place and I had ordered some timber from the sawmill, six by half uh, stuff, uh, rough dressed timber to, for the walls. Yeah. Got a bit of old iron for the roof, and we had a place to live. <laughs> we didn't have a stove, had an open fire. I put a block of cement in there. I think I showed you one day, didn't I? No, I showed you. A block of cement down with a, in that place of pips there. No, I haven't seen it, Dad. Haven't you? Where I showed somebody it? in Pips Farm. Yeah. Did you, know, did you know where I had the shack? No, I don't. You don't? No. Well, it must have been somebody else, I thought it was you. No, it must have uh, been uh, Tom or... or anyway, I put a, the block of cement should still be there. Oh. And uh, later on, when we got out of the place, Piff uh, bought all the shed and he built a banana shed out of it, you know, packing bananas. Yeah. But... Um, Whereabouts was it on, on in relation to Piff's house? No, it was way down away from his house. Oh, it was? Yeah. Like? Uh, it was between the railway line, you know, the railway line comes out of the tunnel and goes up towards the other number two tunnel. Yes. Well, that was all pips on the other side of the line. Oh, I see. Yeah. Between the, uh, up and around the hill. Yeah. And uh, that's where we shipped it. And uh, incidentally, I fell all that bush, I contract, I fell all the scrub. It's all grown up now. Yeah. yeah. And Piff planted ba bananas in it. I worked in them. But um, then I got s bits of jobs here and there, and that's when they uh, they started sand mining. Oh. And I got odd jobs then when I was living there, working on the sand mining. Yes. Uh, testing the beaches and so forth. And. Uh, Got a few pounds together that way to keep ourselves from starving. But on the uh, other hand, we had a pretty lean time too. I think I've told you before about uh, being hard up and what the mother did frying some onions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, is that, I think that, is that in here? Yeah, I think it's in. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Tell, me, tell me a bit more about living in the, in the actual hut. Oh. It was just one single room, was it? Just a single room, yeah. and uh, dirt floor, yeah. and we had our bed and old kitchen dresser and the table, that's all we had. And incidentally, uh, um, one of the newspapers put the bailiffs in on us. Yeah? Yeah, he came out to, uh, and he found out what we had, so he decided it wasn't worth bothering with, and he just went away. Yeah. Never said any more about it. Well, you can't get blood yeah. out of a stone, no. I suppose. we could we were broke, stony. Yeah. We so this nothing. was what was left over from the shop. You still owed 
a bit of money to the newspapers that you'd sold. Yeah, newspapers. Northern yeah. Star was one of them. Ah. It might have been Northern Star put in the bailiffs, I ah. don't know. But anyhow, I, and they were worried, and I was worried <laughs> having to go live. Yeah. And I remember when I was building this place, I was working flat out all the room and time. Not much to eat, I suppose. No. And uh, I remember I got that bloody crook there once. I uh, made me way into Mullen Bimby and saw Dr. Gibson. Yeah. And he said, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> he said, you're just worn out. So uh, I had to take it easy for a while. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I did odd jobs around the place, whatever I could get, anything. Yeah. Anything at all. Yeah. Chipping. Yeah. Anything at all. And, um, I think it was then I fell this, all this scrub, yeah. the scrub, the contract work, round the hill there, and he planted bananas. Oh. And um, then the beach work started up when we, there's myself and Sid Flowers, or oh, a couple of other chaps, I've forgotten their name yeah. now, it was like too long ago. Yeah. We tested the beach right from Brunswick Head right up to uh, Bengal, all the way. Um, I think I've described that previously. Yes, you have. I think that um, yeah. we went into that pretty well, in fact. That yes, we did. That was a really interesting yeah. lot of history there because that, um, I mean, it's an unknown thing now. That's all gone. And all yes, the, it is. All of that. Uh, uh, what did I do then? All those various things I did there. I even planted passion fruit on the railway land at the tunnel there, yeah. on the Billy Nudgel side. But I uh, got work before I, before I did any more, if you understand. Mm. Uh, I managed to get some work and I let the passion food go. Right. Yeah. But, um, let's see. Yes, we, after that we went to live at the beach. We left the place and went to live down on New Brighton. And uh, oh, it was uh, intermittent. I uh, I worked up the middle pocket, which uh, various jobs up there. And um, I remember another bit of a mess there too. I uh, riding up the pocket every day. And I got that exhausted. I had the same treatment. <laughs> yeah. What I did when I was building up the house, I got ex really exhausted, you know. Yeah. Just shivering and going on uh, that week. Yeah. Not a lot of food about, I suppose. Hmm? Not much food and. and no, and not much to eat. And, and a lot of hard work. I didn't have much to eat, you know. Yeah. It's long, it's a fair distance, like when you're bright and right up at the top end of the pocket. Yes. And Devereaux and. Farms right up the top end of it. Yes. Going up there, ride the bike, and then have to park your bike at the road and walk in up the bloody mountain. Yes. Pretty steep. But I think at that time, uh, I think Fred Smith was about to leave that dairy farm, and I went and saw Piff and got the job after he left. Yes. So my, your mother and I went and worked there. We run it. Ten pounds a month we got yeah. keep ourselves. Yeah. Later on, he, he uh, got to be generous and he gave me ten bob for every pig I could fatten. Oh. Make things a bit better for us, you know. Oh, oh he's quite fair, but uh, the times were hard and yeah. he wasn't making money himself. No. So we were there, and uh, we looked up to forty-eight cows, but your mother couldn't stand it either. It was too much for her. Yes. And I knew it. And at the same time, we had the bananas what I said we'd planted. <laughs> I had to have <laughs> plant. I had to run a banana plantation, work in them spare time. Yes. And uh, plenty to do. That's the place Pip was telling me about the nice house we had to live in. I said, Frank said, the house is okay. I said, but I'm only in it to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it was right. And what was this nice house? Oh, the one that was there on top of the hill there. Do you know where it is? Uh, 
top of the Tunnel Hill there. Oh, that one. That, that one. Is that still the same house that was no, there? No, it's been, it's been rebuilt since. Moved away. But it was there for years. Where the tree, tree called Tom is. Eh? Where the tree called Tom is. Yeah, yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I nearly forgot where it was now. Sorry. Eh? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's where you're there, but as I said, it's too much for your mother. That's yeah. when uh, Eddie was only a little bloke then. So you already had Eddie then? Yes, Eddie was born just before we went onto that farm. Oh. I don't know where we were. And uh, I remember we used to take him up the cow bales and there was a spare bale there. We used to put in a case, packing case there while we did the milking. And the old cow there used to come and lick him. The old cow called Yarra. He <laughs> 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 laughed about this he's a tame old thing, you know. Uh. Used to lick him and uh, I remember the Brimland Bull there is a bit of a nuisance too. He's a bad wretch. Yeah. Uh, you get to the neighbour's farm, and that's when they had the blue dog. Oh, yes. And uh, he'd get mixed up with the cows, and the neighbour didn't mind because he's a purebred bull. Yeah. And uh, I'd take Bluey down, and I'd say the bull blew, and he'd head straight for that bull. <laughs> and by gee, he'd make it quick pass back home. <laughs> Chase through fences, gates, anything. You yeah. go right down the bottom end of the farm and stand there snorting. Uh, He's frightened. I wouldn't ever have handled him otherwise. Uh, is this the um, the bull that Mum swung round by the tail? Uh, so she said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that, that was Eddie. Yeah. But yeah. by gee, um, there's one thing that bull never woke up to. He's a pretty cunning rooster. Mm. And uh, he never woke up. I used to. He, he'd been bailed up since he's a potty calf, you know, in the cow bail. And yes. you could run him up in the cow bail and slap the bales up on him, and he stand there. Right. Never woke up to the fact he could easily smash everything, and get away. He could, yeah. And I could put a chain into the ring in his nose and lead him out. Yes. And tie him up to the fence or anywhere. And uh, oh, well, he saw his head, horns off and everything later on. He get cranky, you know. Yeah. But uh, he's a bit of a menace. Uh, yeah. I, I just remember Mum telling that incredible tale about how she jumped in and swung the bull round by the tail because Eddie yeah. was standing oh, there. He, he might have got him off balance too, you know. Yeah. Quite possible. Yeah. Yes, on that farm too, I planted, uh, I built him new pig styes, pig runs, yeah. and uh, I split all the timber. Did all this. I uh, planted sweet potatoes there. I had different varieties of sweet spuds and I fed the pigs on them and ourselves. Fed <laughs> <laughs> the pigs and us as well. Yes. <laughs> and uh, matter of fact, uh, he told me later on in years I made more money off the farm than anyone ever had before or since. Yeah. When I was there, oh yes. I rotated all the paddocks. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all, all different paddocks, and I'd save the good paddocks for the bad weather. It was sheltered. Yes. Worked things out, and uh, he never told me how much he made, but I measured the milk every milking. I know exactly how much milk the cows were given. Yeah. <laughs> I had all the, um, I knew the, when the cows were going to have their calves. Yeah. All that sort of thing. This is because you kept diaries of it, and, eh? and you kept a diary of it. Yeah, I caught a record of everything. Yes. And um, when I left, I had a book with all the cows when they were going to carve and all that sort of thing. And he said, what's that you've got there? I said, a book with all the, about all the cows and calves and so forth. Oh, he said, can I have it? I said, well, it's no further use to me. <laughs> so I give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we stayed there for three years. And by that time, uh, another chap had bought the sand mining, the name of Knowles. Yes. And uh, he decided to go up to Tweed. So I saw Tom Groom and I went with them up to Woolumba. Yes. And we got a house up in, uh, oh, what is it, Hive Street, I think. Anyhow, it doesn't matter much. Got a house in Woolumba and they started up the factory in Woolumba. Uh. And uh, 
Well, I went along there all right, uh, up to a point. He had a lot of fancy ideas, you know. I think I told you a lot of this too about his building the various things, you know, that wouldn't work. Yes. And yes. about the sawmill being a long left lying alongside of it That's and that right. sort of thing. I yes. told you that. Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, yes. And uh, the ship getting sunk. Yes, that's but right. uh, after that, I went up to, um, I was still in Woolenbar. I think I told you too about going on to the Bidges. Um, I think you did. I, yeah. I, 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 um, I mean, I have heard the story before. You, you, um, I think so. I think I read it yesterday. Right, right. I was but just I trying to quickly go mother. through here and see whether I could find it, yes. Yeah, I can tell you some other episodes. Yes, yeah. For instance, about Herb Smith. I don't know if I told you not about the time he rapped the roosters. Yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> came to me one day, I was on a woman's dairy farm, he came up to the yard and he wanted to know would I go in for a ruffle, a shilling ruffle, for a pair of roosters he's raffling. I said, yes, Herb, I, I'd go in, but I haven't got the shilling. Well, he said, I'll put you in. But he said, if I win the, if you win the roosters, he said, you give one back. Well, I said, that sounds a good enough proposition. So I, uh, he put me in, and I won the roosters. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, Herb, this looks a bit fishy to me. <laughs> 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 no, no, spare to me, he said, it's no, no, really stuff, he said. You run a fair bear, he said, it's drawn down the pub bar, he said, everything's right. <laughs> so I got a rooster for nothing. <laughs> Another episode with Herb uh, Smith. Uh, what is this? Is oh, it's oh, all right. It's just that that's twisted round now, there. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's Herb Smith. He came to you one day. It came out in the Northern style. They wanted all the uh, line alongside the railway line, the railway telegraph. You know, the telephone line. Yes. To clear all the undergrowth from underneath it. Uh, and you had to put in tenders and you had to send five pound f with the tenders as a good faith, you know. Right. So anyhow, that was okay, but we didn't have five pound. And Herb couldn't borrow money and nobody would give him any money. He couldn't borrow money no matter which way he went. <laughs> so he said to me, well, you get the fiver. Uh. So I went and borrowed five pound and sent the tender away. Anyhow, I never got to, I never did anything about it. I think it cost too much, you know. Yeah. Anyhow, my big job then was to get the five pound back from the railway. Yeah. And I wrote to the headquarters in Lismore here uh, for quite a, oh, three or four letters and got no replies. So I wrote, a, finally I wrote to the Railway Commission in Sydney and I did get the five pound back. You did? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. They didn't, they didn't exactly want to part with it by the sound of it. No, but I got it anyhow and give it to... It was yeah. a bit Moppet, really. It loaned uh -huh. me the money. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Herb couldn't borrow money anyway. Nobody would lend him money, you know. <laughs> I'm just looking up here that... Um, that was the Herb Smith here that, um, that talked about the cat. That That's had to him, go. Yes. Same bloke. Yeah. yeah. Had to go 100 yards to dig a hole. Yeah. yeah. Um, what else? Mm. Switch it off for a moment, I think. Okay. But uh, you see, Jack Hayward, he uh, used to play around in Mullumbimby. I got to hear of it. A chap called Fisher told me, uh, George Fisher. Yes. All about it. He used to, he used to call in the possum in Mullumbimby, getting in people's windows. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> he used to say to me, how's the possum going? Yeah. And uh, things like that. Now, well, uh, yes, I would, uh, Jack Hayward made up of this uh, woman. Matter of fact, she seemed a decent kind of woman, but you see, Alan, at, during wartime like that, when you're separated for your wives, things like that went going on all the time. Yeah. Yes. And uh, she wasn't a bad woman. I've, I've been to the house when I was in Sydney. My, I told me about her too. So he still stayed with this same woman that he, that he took up? Yes, with. the same one. Oh yes, uh -huh. and I had dinner, I didn't have I had a cup of tea with him, and she seemed quite okay. But uh, he uh, 
under the war re rehabilitation scheme uh, when he came back he got uh, the skin disease uh, like an eczema thing oh yes uh, a lot of people like that during the war they uh, couldn't find a cause for the reckon was cured for the uh, material in the uniforms and they course said it was caused by soap dermatitis that's what it is oh. bloody dermatitis is that right yeah he got dermatitis and he's in hospital to Darwin and I used to go and see him when I was up there up there to get he was in uh, some oh. artillery battery or something but uh, that's where he was and uh, anyhow he, uh, I think uh, he's, he's, he's a doctor's wife or something like that kind you know yeah but uh, oh yes he had a flat at uh, where was it uh, Cremorne uh -huh. he had a flat there for a good while they lived together mm. and as I said he uh, he studied uh, accountancy yes and apparently he did pretty well right this is when he was repatriated yeah, the army. when he patriot when he got mm. out of the army, uh, he got on pretty well. And uh, Elsie told me that he was Elsie. Yeah, I think it was Elsie said that he became a teacher later on, teaching yeah. the uh, other accountants. You know, oh. so he must have become pretty well, yeah. pretty good. Yeah. But uh, what I know of him, when he's younger, he's an unstable sort of a buggy, you know. Oh. But he settled down later on. It was a Haywood family. I mean, see, um, Harry seemed to be a pretty good sort of a bloke. Eh? Harry. Oh, Harry's a good fella. Yeah. Harry is. He's a different sort of bloke to Jack altogether. Because Jack was the eldest, wasn't Jack he? Was a, yeah, Jack was a flash sort of a bastard. <laughs> he was. He used to put on side, you know, and yes. make out he's really somebody. Oh, yeah. Oh. I took no notice of him. Silly bugger, I remember one night uh, we was going up to school, the school paddocks of Billy Nudge, he going up to see me and he had a few beers in him. He said, I feel like having a fight. I said, do you? Well, there's a pine tree there, said, beyond punch it, and he did. That <laughs> 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 stupid bastard. <laughs> oh. So I, I was interested to, to find, like, that he, this fella, this Jack, took yeah. up with May. Yeah. And then, because I think we talked about that earlier, about May uh, and then Elsie yeah. really introduced Mum to you in Billy Nudgel. She did, yes. So obviously these, um, it was John who, or was it Elsie who actually met up with the Chawners first? She did. Was Elsie was the first one. Elsie. Elsie yeah. came over there to just, because she, she was... working for Wayne. Right. And of course, uh, we were about the leading family in Billy Nudge at that time. Dad yes. being a teacher and that. Yes. And of course, she thought it was a great thing to get mixed up with the Chawners. Right. <laughs> and uh, she had a big idea of her own beauty and uh -huh. what she could do with men. And she uh, told your mother all the sorts of bloody stories. All the men around Billy Nudge and love her and all this bloody silly bullshit, you know. <laughs> oh, she thought of it too. You know, she really thought, think she did. Yeah. She really carried away. Oh. If she'd did known what some of the blokes said about her, she'd get a shock. Yeah. <laughs> did did uh, did Elsie actually take up with any of the 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 Chawner family then? Yes, she did. Oh. See, Bill Watson, the bloke she married finally, mm. he'd gone up to Queensland cutting cane to make some money to get married. Mm. And she's a Billy Nudgel, and she made up with Ben. Oh, oh she strung Ben along. Yeah. And no question, if your mother's only alive, she could tell you the same. Yeah, she made a fool of Ben. Oh. And uh, Ben got uh, very fond of her. Tell me, that would mean, was Ben actually younger than Elsie? Um, or would he be pretty no, close to the same no. age No, ben, ben was two years younger than I am. Right, okay. And that would It'd have been much about the same age. About the same age. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Elsie uh, strung him on, and uh, Ben got infatuated with her, you know. Yeah. And your mother uh, saw it was coming, and she did the best she could. I'll give your mother credit for that, yeah. you know. She did her best. And, uh, but anyhow, Bill has come back, 
and to make things better with the family, she went and told her mother all sorts of things about Ben. Ben tried to rape and Ben tried to do this and Ben tried to do that. Oh, really? Yes. And we knew it was all bloody bullshit, you know. Oh. So that would have caused some animosity initially in the family. Yes. And uh, Elsie, went, Elsie went and told her, and told her mother. And I remember being to Mullum, went to Mullumbimby show with Ben. Yes. And old Mum Hayward went for Ben's gone hot. And he innocent, he just stood there dumb. Yeah. He didn't know what it was all about. Poor bugger. Yes. And anyhow, give her the old lady credit for this, she found out later. And her, Ada, your mother said uh, she took to Elsie with a bloody <laughs> silky whip. <laughs> Did she? Yeah, <laughs> give her a bloody eye. <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah. These, these women then were around about 18 or 19. Yeah. Uh, sort of still, still really young people away from home. Yeah. Man. Oh yes. Uh, your mother said uh, she took to Elsie with a bloody sulky weapon to her thrash it. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a, obviously there was a strong likelihood of having three brothers and three sisters. Eh? Yeah. There was a there was a likelihood oh, of having yes. three brothers with or three sisters. Oh yes. Or sooner married, you know. Yeah. But uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Oh, well, later on. Uh, Oh, well, that was Elsie's part of the business, you know. Yes. I never did that much time for Elsie. She's sober down now, you know. But yes, I always felt that she was a very sort of straight-laced... Oh, yes. Know. Oh, yeah. she thought she was something when she was young. Yes. Oh, ghost, yes. She thought she was a bloody marble. All the men around the place was in love with her. Yes. And I know one pub said to me, she's only a bloody cock teaser. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's fairly standard practice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's some... Um, oh, no, bugger no. the bloody phone. She and John, I think at home, uh, you might have got a pretty rough trot between a lot of them. Yeah, it's certainly and my impression. And that's what accounted for her, the way she was. Yes. You know, she didn't have enough self-confidence and things like that, you know. Yes. Sort of inferiority sort of business, and I think they're the cause of a lot of it. Mm. But uh, anyhow, uh, with all this uh, talk of Bill Watson and Elsa, they get married, of course, and uh, John, Mary and May, and didn't turn out very well. And I can tell you this, my mother, she was very sore about it, and she reckoned it caused a lot of trouble in the family, you know. Yeah. When I took up with the mother, well, that was a last <laughs> draw sort of thing, you know. <laughs> and she yeah. didn't like your mother at all for quite a while. Yes. And uh, Mum told your mother so too. She said she wasn't good enough. Yes. Your mother said she's good enough for anybody. <laughs> 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 you know, her. Yes. But uh, anyhow, over the years, it's all forgotten. And but uh, your mother was terrible pleased when we were in Woolumbar. My mother came up and stayed with us. Yes. For a fortnight. Yeah. Mm. And uh, we got it really yeah. well. Yeah, it must have been a hard time because I can remember uh, Mum talking about that. Yeah. And she never forgot it, of course, that uh, she went up to the house of Billy Nudgel. Yeah. I, was it a... I, must I don't know whether it was a Billy Nudgel. Uh, it couldn't have been a Billy Nudgel. It must have been a Mullum uh, to see Mum, and and that's what she said to her yeah, then. Yeah, up in Wal yes, yeah. That that she wasn't good enough for you. Yeah. And I think that that's what she said to me. That she said she's <laughs> bloody good enough for anybody. Yeah. But it must have been hard if if Mum was the third one in the line. Yeah. To um with two people that had already well I was was uh, May not broken up with, with Jack. Oh, no, that time, but they weren't seen to get known yeah. together, you know. Oh, hello. Here's Carol. Oh. Oh, no wonder we can't get you out at the uni. Why and bloody Lucy. See, Ben and I, we grew up together, good mates, and she was jealous as hell of me, Lucy was. Yeah. She didn't like me around the place. <laughs> Women are funny. Yes. That was I, I still recall that too. I, I 
I recall going to Coolangatta to see Uncle Ben. Yeah. In his little shop. Yeah. But he he um he did quite well out of it though, didn't he? Oh yes, he made money. Yeah. Oh well, they did pretty well, Alan, because uh, they got married and they would with Buds and Woolenbar for years, and he was a salesman and she was a bookkeeper. Uh -huh. So there were two wages coming in. Yes. And then they must have made the money to buy in down there at Cool and Gutter, you see. Yeah. And he did pretty well there, I know. Yeah, I've still got his book on paint technology too. Have you? Yeah, I've shown that about at the college. Yeah. Yeah. And they, um, but they didn't have any children. No. Hmm. No, no kid. Yeah. Well, Ben was a different type of bloke to Bill and I all the time. Yes. Hmm. In, in what, what way do you mean? Oh, well, matter of fact, he is built different to me. <laughs> yeah. Ben gave me some of his old pants, for instance. Yeah. And look, we we're the same height, but they're altogether wrong for me. Yeah. Yeah. He had big hips, and I had none, things like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I always thought he was sort of fatter. Oh, he was. He's, he's yeah. a different build altogether. Yeah. Yeah. He's but, obviously uh, throwback there. Oh, he? Ben was a fairly smart fellow, you know. Yeah. But I don't think he's any smarter than Bill or I. Oh. Matter of fact, uh, Grierson, had, uh, he reckoned I was the smartest of the family, yeah. but I don't know how he'd know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, did create imo animosity. Uh, I don't blame Mum in a way because uh, it was a bad start, you know. Yeah. But uh, when she came and stayed with us in Woolenbar for a fortnight, and your mother and the, her got real, real well together. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, quite content with each other then, oh. because Ada, your mother was a different type of woman to Elsie. Yeah. Oh yes, different type. Different type altogether. Yeah. Yeah. They might look alike, but they weren't alike. No. Yeah, no, well, I, I, I think she had a bad trot at home. Yeah. Because yeah. the others, when you know uh, people stand over you. Yeah. And didn't do any good. Give her an inferiority complex, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so she certainly had that, didn't she? Yeah. I tried to get her out of it for bloody years and yeah. years. Yeah. Well, I think she did get better. Yes. Now, I must say that um, as kids, um, I was the last, obviously, but she, um, we sort of caught it off her a lot. You know, huh? we caught that sort of thing off her. Yeah, you know, yeah. That sense of um, if anyone had money or, you know, that looked a little different, then they were obviously better than we were, you know. It was yeah, sort of, yeah. It uh, was a real problem for Mum. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can see that that's where these things would come from with um, yeah. having a hard Oh, I know. Like your, your mother there, uh, she's worked, before we got married, she's working for various people. And I remember she's working for a headmaster of Mullumbibby Public School yeah. for a while. And I used to go there and see her. And she used to be envious of me. She, she, she said, you can come here and talk a high class language to him. <laughs> you know, I could talk the same language as he could, and she couldn't. Yeah. She didn't like, you know, knew the difference and yeah. things like that. Yes, I must say that she, and yet, uh, Mum was able to do all those things in, you know, academically. She was quite good. Oh yes, matter of fact, uh, bloody crossword puzzles and things like that. Oh no, she's no slouch. No, she's sensible enough. My yeah. bloody oath. Yeah. I won't anyone think she is a deal she's making a mistake. Yeah. But she didn't have that confidence. Yeah. So, I mean, in things like that with Mum, while you were out working and doing all this work, yeah. say, you know, going back to Piff's farm, yeah. Mum was struggling away in, in this little house yeah. with, what, four kids by that time? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it was a pretty tough time. Oh, no, I know, yeah. I reckon your mother's a wonderful woman to put up with it. Yeah. And she never complained. Yeah. 
I know she never thought bloody given up at any time. Yeah. She knew new thing did come good. Yeah. Well, they were tough times too in the thirties, of course. Well, they were bad for everyone. Yes. And uh, people made it worse because they uh, had the wrong attitude. Mm. If you're down and out, well, stick the bloody boot in. Yeah. No question about that. Yeah. I don't know whether we actually got, did we actually, in here in this stuff that you read the other day, um, there were stories about Margaret, that Margaret t tells about having um, shoes with uh, cardboard soles and oh, wearing yeah. them out on the first day. And That's a fact. Yes. Yeah. I'm telling you a low lie, no, no lie, Alan, when I was in the farm, all I had was a bloody black singlet and a pair of shorts. No hat, no boots, nothing. Yeah. Working. Yeah. Never wore bloody boots for ages. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No money. I had a pair of shoes, reasonably good to go out. I used to go to lunch at Manchester Unity. I had to give better eat up because I couldn't pay the bloody contributions. Yeah. They kept me good on the books for two years. And I told her, give it up. I said, I can't. I'll never be able to pay it. Yes. You'd have to pay it back. So I chucked it in. Yeah. I went all through the bloody chairs and everything in the Manchester Unity. Did you? Yeah. I remember you were still in a, in Lismore. Oh, yes, I went late. back, but not as a paying member. Uh -huh. mm. And the lodge was a big thing then, wasn't it? Oh, it was, yes, yes. Because what, what sort of things did you get out of being in the lodge? Oh, well, uh, benefits. Uh, you could sort of write the medical benefits affair. Yes. And you could get discounts, you know, for going to the doctor and chemistry and that sort of thing, you know. And besides having the fellowship, oh, if it was carried out properly, it's a really good thing. Yeah. It'll start in England uh, when people are hard up and to get together, you know, have time together. Oh, lots of different kinds of them. Manchester Union is a Grand United. Yeah. High Burning Lodge and all sorts of things, you know. Oh, it was a, a few years back, say, 40, 50 years ago, lodges were in a pretty strong position, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But they was, I can re recall very, in, in very early days in South Lismore that, that you used to go to those meetings and everyone wore those aprons and... Oh, yes, had all the regalia. Yeah. I still got the regalia, but it's a bit knocked about, went through the bloody 45 flood. <laughs> uh -huh. Spoiled it. You've still got it? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, yes, I went through... I've been the master and all that sort of thing. I went right through the chair. Hmm. And that, that requires public speaking and... Oh, well, um, I think you, you had to pass off all the officers before you become the, uh, the grand, noble grand, as they call it, here's a bloke in charge. You had to go through all, all the officers first. Right. You had to be elective secretary and the vice grand or the vice chairman, you know, and finally you got to the leader of it. Although I, um, there was one girl, she wanted to go through the bloody lodge, but she couldn't manage the bloody um, secretary business, so I did it for her. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I just took down the minutes and wrote them out and she read them at the next meetings. Yeah. So I got her through. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you got to help them. And so there were women and men in the in the lodge, there was no discrimination? Oh, no, not at all. Mm. Oh, no, not at all. Oh, Jesus. Sisters and brothers refer to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I remember going... Um, a long time ago, going to Grafton or somewhere, it was really a big deal. Oh, yes. And we went to this big meeting, but it nearly killed me because everyone spoke. Yeah. And they seemed to take years. Yeah. There was one particular person we knew, there was a relative, it could be, I don't know, was someone 
think the gambles were in it, weren't they? One yeah, of oh, one yeah. Of those that, that sp seemed to speak for half an hour yeah. or an hour. Yeah. I'll tell you something. Yeah. Eddie's Grand Master of the Bloody Masonic Lodge in Lismore. Oh, he is, is he? Yes. Oh. Matter of fact, repeating this year. Oh. It's the second time. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> oh no, I can recite some bloody funny episodes with the Lodge, too. Yeah. Um, one night there was a function, and... Um, and Lawrence Stevenson, he's a big gangling sort of a bloke. And Molly Little, she was a very proper sort of a girl, you know. And had this dinner and had to give speeches. And Lawrence Stevenson had to propose the toast of the sisters. So he gets up and he gives a bit of a speech. And he said he finished up by saying he had to cut his thing short. <laughs> <laughs> And Molly gets up to respond. <laughs> and she had this in the mind, I suppose. And she finished up by saying, his brother Stephen had to cut his thing short, she'd have to do the same. He was too much wrong. Oh, gee, she's embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> And one year, they used to have a uh, Manchester in ball and been in Dungeons every year at that time, you know. And one year they put streamers all across the hall this way and then others across this way, but they put them in and out, you know, so yeah. just like lattice, you know. Yeah. And the following year, discussing the, the ball, what they do, and one fellow, uh, Bartlett, he got up and he said, I think we'll do the same as we did last year, the up and down business on the floor. <laughs> they put it all together on the floor and just pulled it up. Right. Oh, dear. Up and down business on the floor. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> bring the house episode. down, eh? Eh? You brought the house down. Yeah. And of course, there's that one about the bloody uh, field of arts meeting. I suppose I told you that one. Fair dinkum too. Yeah. As a committee of the uh, <laughs> School of Arts. One, I'll tell you a bit after you can put it on tape. But yeah. this other, uh, what is it about now? Uh, oh yes, uh, they had this committee meeting. And the hall wasn't making much money because of bloody wet weather. People had put on uh, entertainment, balls and that, and the rain that night, and it'd be put off. And there's no revenue. Mm. We had this bloody meeting discussing the bloody revenue, and Bill Moffat gets up. And he said, these people, he said, that pick their date, should hold their balls. <laughs> 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 so I said, well, <laughs> he looked around and I couldn't make out what he'd said. <laughs> it did seem a bit odd, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and another one about Herb Smith. He was the secretary and also the caretaker cleaner of the School of Arts. And at that time, there was no room for Catholic Church, and they used to have church every Sunday morning in the hall. And the hall, when they went there in the morning, was often very untidy. So they'd write a letter to the secretary, complaining about the state of the hall. And the secretary would hand it to the cleaner, to the caretaker. This bloody memorandum, you know. Yeah. Write to him. <laughs> he write to his bloody self. Yes. <laughs> 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 write to himself, and he'd reply, <laughs> and explain everything. <laughs> And send him back to the bloody secretary. It was sort of out of bloody silly business. <laughs> <laughs> Open laughed over that. <laughs> <laughs> he put his other hat on. Yes. Yes, he writing letters to himself. <laughs> but he did this in a real business like fashion, you know, and it seemed bloody stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. 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 Like, the entertainment that you had then, now obviously, in that in that hard time was you you went to the lodge when you could yeah but 
There was, did you have a radio or? No. No, uh, we got our first radio when we were on the farm. Mm. It's a Tasma. And it was a good machine too, incidentally. And uh, I know Bridgeland is from Mullumbimby. He travelled around and he came to the house and we made arrangements to get it. But you see, we weren't aware of the bloody uh, terms. We knew we had to pay off uh, by instalments. Yes. But you see, we didn't know the, uh, the bis this business of... Uh, Interest. Interest. Mm. And gee, your mother went crook over that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I had no idea, but she didn't have no idea at all, you know. Yeah. And gee wish she went to market. But I'd say it was a good set. Yeah. I'd tell them, we had for years a battery set. <coughs> we had to send a battery in the bottom to uh, get charged now and again. You know. Oh, was it rechargeable? Mm. Oh, a battery. Mm. Yeah. A, run wet, a wet battery? Yeah, a big wet battery. Mm. So we had to send it into Mullumbimby and get a charge occasionally. Mm. But it was a bloody good set. I've mm. seen bigger sets, uh, more stylish than that, but it's a better set than a lot of other people that had, mm. you know, supposed to be better sets, you know. And that was, so you didn't get to the farm until, what, ap well after the Depression? Oh, there was, uh, there was still a bit of Depression, but you see, the position was, Alan, we had no bloody recreation. Your mother was in the bloody house but nothing there, yeah. so we really put ourselves out to get this bloody yeah. radio. Right, so other than that you'd, you'd go to church or did you go to church or? Oh no, no we didn't go to church because we were too far away from the bloody church. Oh. We'd have to walk you see, we had no means of travelling mm. around. And did you go out to see people or? No. You couldn't? No, we had no way of going, yeah. we had to walk. Yeah. Oh, we walked around bloody miles, your mother and I. Yeah. Oh, yes, when we were living in New Brighton, we used to walk up to Billy Nudgel, up the road. Yeah. Yes. With all the kids? With the kids, yes. Yeah. And that's where that episode with Tom jumping off the railway line. That's right. Yeah. Your mother was making her way back. Yeah. She's coming back from Nudgel and walking down to New Brighton, and she's going across the bloody bridge, and then Tommy hopped off. Going, yeah, yeah, Tom, wasn't it? Yeah. But the, there was a great story about that, wasn't there? That the train was coming. Oh, no. Uh, oh, it might have been, Alan. I don't know for sure because I wasn't there. Yeah. It's only hearsay. Yeah, well, of course, Margaret. Margaret yeah. knows all about it. Margaret has the story. Yeah, she has the story. And Tom, apparently, has a slightly different story. But Yeah. The only one thing I do know that he, he jumped off and there uh, was going to be some concrete work there and had a heap of metal and yeah. he landed on the metal and I think that broke it, yeah. broke his fall, see. It sort of spread out when he hit it. And right. I know um, your mother took him down to the butcher shop. <laughs> Clary played to put it on the butcher's block and looked all over him and <laughs> Nance is now broken bones and he had a bit of a hard case, you know. And Anyhow, he's all right, there's nothing yeah. wrong with him. Yeah. yeah. So it must have been, so you had no no kind of entertainment, no radio? No. So no. all you, yeah. No, we had nothing at all most of the time, except when we were going to farm. We, we really put ourselves out to get the radio. We, well, old Pip was glad too, because he wanted us to be happy, you know? Yeah. And uh, he, and said the best thing we ever did to get the TV and thing uh, is the radio. Yeah. And we had it. We, uh, I think we had it. We took it to Woolloombar and it folded up and we bought a little Phillips. Uh huh. Hmm. But in the farm, we, the TV, or the radio was very good because we had these uh, Dad and Dave used to come on about six and we'd hurry up to get down to the house to hear Dad and Dave, you know. Yeah. I'll, uh, uh, blue, what's his name? Um, uh, bottle. Blue bottle. Huh? Oh, school. Yes, you know. yes, sir. Yes, or sir. Please, sir. Or yeah, yeah. Oh, it was bloody funny. <coughs> Matter of fact, a lot of that stuff is far funnier than a lot you hear over now. Yeah. It was really bloody funny. Was and Blue Hills on then too? Oh yes, Blue Hills and uh, the woman in white and the man in grey and 
and Corsicans and things like that are really good stories. Yeah. My word. Yeah. So really it is uh, worth having. So it was just like TV today. It was just really like TV, ascensive. just the same. Yeah. And we used to listen in, but uh, they were good. But you, um, I, I know mum, mum said to me once that she actually sang on the radio. Is she that, what? She sang on the radio. Yeah. Is that right? Oh, I think, um, you know, being on the radio, you know, it's great. Yes. Oh, I think they did. I think her and Una and they sort of got together in Lisboa. Uh-huh. Something like that. I, I, I think it might have been a Before way. Before your you know. time or? Well, I'm um, probably way to war or something. Oh, in, something. in the war? Yeah, probably was. Hmm. It's, um, did you, you played an instrument though, didn't you? You, you can play. I used to play the mouth organ. The mouth organ. Did you have a mouth organ then? I got one now. Yeah. Um, but uh, since I got the bloody forged teeth, I can't play it. Ah. Yeah. But did you? So did you have any kind of? Um, did you play any music around the home or? Oh, I used to play the mouth organ sometimes. Yeah. But I learned to play it back to front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been awkward. <laughs> I did. Yeah. yeah. How can you learn to play it back to front? Oh, well, the bass is one side and the bloody thing the other. Yeah. And I put it in the mouth organ in back to front and I used to play it that way. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I could play it all right, but uh, it was the odd way of doing it. But I learned it that way. I practiced and I was sitting in the bush, sitting behind a stump and yeah. learned how to play it. Mm. Oh, it was surprising uh, when I was working for old Herb Williams. Um, he picked up a tin whistle. He's walking along the railway. He's an old bugger to walk because he had no way of getting around much, you know, and he used to walk down the middle nudge and he picked up this tin whistle in the railway line as he's walking home. And that night he sat in the kitchen chair and he played this bloody tin whistle and it was good at him, said it, they looked down and his old man astounded, thinking old dad could play the bloody tin whistle and he could play it well too. Yeah. Yes. Really open to his kids, he had five or six kids there. Yeah, old flock of kids, old William. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it is amazing. Oh, they didn't think the old bloke to do anything. <laughs> he play the tin whistle. Yeah. And, um, of course, Mum's dad played the violin, didn't he? Oh, I see he could play the violin, and, uh, matter of fact, his mother said he could play, um, bagpipes or anything, but whether he could, I don't know, yeah. but he could play the violin, I know. Oh. And and he played for local dancers and things like yeah, that? Yeah, play for dancers. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that Jack Wilson was good at dancers. Yeah? Yeah. He could play the bloody, he could play a fiddle, but he's good on the accordion. Yeah. My word. A button accordion, accordion or oh, you piano know accordion thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, he is pretty good. Matter of fact, Jack Wilson could be a bloody marvellous whistler. Yeah? Oh, yeah, he could stand there and whistle away. You ever heard a whistler? I'm well, he was sure. really good. <laughs> no, he said that uh, when he was a kid, he could whistle. And he used to whistle for people for, uh, for money. They'd pay him to whistle. Yeah? When he was a kid. He used to pick up a few do um, bob that way when he was a kid, whistling. Well, it must have been a... Um uh, a whistler of uh, of note then, not, not yes. just a whistler. Oh, when we were at Darwin, there was a chap uh, came round with a touring, you know, um, entertainment group, a whistler, a Bluey Malone. And by hell, he could whistle too. Yeah. You know, my bloody oath, you get a good whistler there, they're all right. Was that uh, the whole thing about you know, you're living in the bush and you haven't got that much to do, so you've got to entertain yourself. So, oh, yeah, yeah. what did you do when you came home, you know, after working on the farm when you lived in that little hut? Oh, well, I wasn't much to bloody do, that's all. Yeah. Oh. So, how did Mum cook? You had, had uh, a camp oven or? Yeah, the camp oven. Hmm. No, I remember from the farm, Alan, we had a wood stove, big black kettle on it. 
And every time we went to the bloody house to get some hot water, the bloody thing was always empty. Yeah. <laughs> and I used to go crook, I said, should be a call the house of no bloody kettles. <laughs> <laughs> There's never any hot water. Mum used to forget to put bloody water in it. Yeah. Yeah. The old cast iron kettle. That photograph that's that's there that's got there's one photograph of Margaret. And then there's another photograph with you and Mum, and I, I presume you're holding Margaret. Yeah. You know where that might have been taken? No. Because that's um. That's a, the oldest of those photographs that I yeah. can see. Yeah. No. I, I really couldn't say. And the photographs are really rare around that time. You obviously couldn't yeah. afford to to have photographs done. No. You had no cameras or anything. No, I, uh, I don't know where it could have been taken, Alan. There's virtually no photographs at all through that period, even through the war, and they really flourish again after the war. Yeah. It's, um, you must have lost a lot of things in the floods, too. In oh, we did. Yeah. That's what I say, Alan. I think we did pretty bloody well. People might look down on you for not having any money, but by Jesus, with all the bloody tribu tribulations we had, it's a wonder we ever had anything. Yeah. Because I lost everything at, in the fire up at Kyogle. Yeah. Except the clothes were wearing. Yeah. And I didn't have much, we didn't have much money at the uh, sawmill, you know, I owned to us. I remember we went and got it and borrowed Jack Woods could drive a car. He borrowed an old car off of a chap called Herb Davis. We drove into bloody Kyogle and bought as much as we could with the money we had. Yeah. Yeah. And by Jesus, you remember, uh, you never know till you lose everything how much you really want. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite uh, a well-established little hut, wasn't it, that, that oh house? Oh, yes. But uh, I remember Jack Wilson, uh, we went at, I think the name of this store was Juna's, Juna's store. Mm. And we bought a lot of stuff there and fell behind the counter. Do you want any more? And Wilson said, he said, your boss should shout us a bear, he said, for buying all this stuff. He said, go and ask him. <laughs> 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 he did. <laughs> he said, no, he said, he won't. Well, no. he said, we, he said, anything else you want? He said, not no. in this bloody place, he <laughs> said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, to start again after fires, um, it just takes everything. Well, yes, we lost... Uh, my, well, uh, we lost a, a beautiful bloody saw. Yeah. We had a grindstone there at the back of the house. <laughs> it was all bad, buggered, you know. Tools, whatever we had in the place. And I knew at that time it was robbed because I had uh, some money in a pants pocket out of the box, you know, to keep me clothes under the bed. Yeah. And uh, I knew I had the coins and that. And I looked in the in the pockets, you know, in the ashes afterwards, and I found the coins. They were okay. People said that the fire destroyed it, you know, but yes. it didn't. Yes. Because I had money there, you know, putting various things, and they were all gone. Ah. So it had to be robbed. Yes. But we couldn't prove a bloody thing. That's obviously why they they burnt the house down too. Yes. Hide the track, you see. Yeah. Oh, we found the bastard that did it years after. Yes. Uh, I was down at Blundry Kids and I was talking to a fellow I knew from up there, uh, Jack McQuilty. Blocker McQuilty with his moniker. <laughs> and got talking about it. He said, uh, do you know who burned it down? I said, no. And he told me who it was. A bloke called Bloody Withers. Yeah. I said, just as well we didn't know. Yeah. God knows what would have done the bastard. We would have killed the bastard yeah. of a thing. Yeah. It's a rotten thing to do. Yes. I know Jack Wilson would. He's a wild bloke. Yeah. My bloody oath. He was brought up rough and he was rough. Mm. No mucking about. Did you, uh, is it in here there, in, in the book that we've, we've already got, in, in this text, is did you mention that bloke that you reckoned was the dirtiest bloke you ever met that used to turn the plate upside down or? No, I never mentioned him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he deserves some mention. <laughs> well, they can put it down somewhere. Yeah. That's from his upper car, Jim Morris. Jim Morris. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> um, we well, have to. You'd have to tell me about um, Jim Morrison. What? What was he in? In a hut on his own, or how did you? I was in a bloody hut with him. Ah. Yes. Ah. No, he had a, a bloody bed in the corner, and he had all sort of bags all around his bed, hanging from the bloody ceiling, and he used to get in behind this to go to sleep, and he never washed his bloody dishes up, or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, I camped with the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and it, that was, you, you said that about his eating habits. Yeah, so I was, uh, He's a rather a big, thick-set sort of fella, yeah. with a bottom moustache sticking out, and a hat he used to, a big hat he used to pull down over his eyes, and you see him peering at you with his big brown eyes. He looked a bad bugger, and he was too, I think, yeah. you know. Yeah. I know he used to treat his bloody horse and things. Nobody yeah. used to like to say anything to him because he was a bad bugger, you know. Yeah. And so he just, he ate his meals and yeah, never washed his dishes. Yeah. But uh, I was only there for a couple of days, and I managed to send into the mill. They had stacks like that in our, a bit of a shop there at the sawmill. Ah. And I managed to get a tin dish, and everything got washed up from then on. Yeah. Yeah. Where was this? This was up at Long Creek still? Yes, uh, well, um, yeah, it was up Long Creek. But you see, the sawmill was a terrace creek, and that's where the logs you could haul in, into yeah. the toilet, terrace creek to be sawn. And Munro and Lever had this store, and they kept uh, essential stuff, you know, a pair of boots or an axe or anything like that you want, or some groceries. Yeah. You could send them in, but uh, they had their own prices too. Yeah, quietly. of course. See, yeah. They played charge with the like. Yeah. And, uh, but you could get lots of stuff. I knew the girl in it. She thought I was going to run off with her for a while, but <laughs> 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 your mother knew it too, she found out. Yeah? Yeah. Oh dear. What's her name? Uh, bug when you can't think of the names. Simpkins, Simpkins. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, well, she's a nice girl. Yeah. Very straightforward sort of a girl. But she had a bloke there and I wasn't going to cut him out, <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah, she's a nice what a Simpkin. Did you know many women before you met Mum? No, okay. Did you know many w women before you met Mum? Did you have any oh, girlfriends? Oh, no, I never was. Any great note? Never a bloody old had a chance. Eh? No. You're busy? No, no chance. <laughs> no, I seem to put in a lifetime of bloody work. Yeah. Oh, no, there was only one up there, there was uh, there's only about three or four girls out Terrace Creek, you know. Yeah. Single girls. This one and her sister. And there's a Mary McQuilty. Funny that um, I went to a dance at Terrace Creek one night. Different sort of dances around here, you know. Pretty rough. And uh, Oh, it came on cold, winter's bloody night, and I had to go home. Nine mile yeah. walk. <laughs> and he said, saying it's going to stop at my place. He said, in our place, McQuilty's. It's Jack McQuilty, blocker. Uh, I said, all right, I will. So I went there, and there was a double bed for him and I to sleep in. And there was a window there with a the pane out of it. <laughs> So I went to bed with him, <laughs> and all bloody night, he'd roll over and take the bloody few blankets of there and pull them off me. Uh -huh. And I'd get on the bus and roll back <laughs> and pull off him. That was all bloody night, and I never forgot that. <laughs> bloody hair froze. Uh, it was the bloody sorriest night's sleep I ever got. <laughs> I wished I'd have went home. Uh, so what was happening at the dances? I mean, there oh, was... Well, uh, just like any country dance, the blokes stand around the doors and the girls wanted to dance. Yeah. Oh, I dance a bit sometimes, not much. But uh, most times they'd have what they called a, a set of the lances, a square dance. Uh -huh. And all the blokes used to get um, up, take all men partners, you know. Yeah? Talk about a wild turnout. 
They're swinging around and trying to swing each other off their feet. I mean, one night one tall bloke lost his feet and he shot across the bloody floor and finished up under the streets <laughs> and the seats around the wall. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, funny. So that, and, and there'd be a few people playing instruments and... Oh, yes, all their own stuff, you know. Yeah. Somebody could play the fiddle and use them find their own piano and things like that, you know. Yeah. Oh, I used to have a bit of fun, you know. Yeah. I remember one night we went to a dance at Terrace Creek. You could you could tournament and dance. We played euchre and this dance after. And somebody produced a quarter of quarter rum. Because we went outside to drink it. Finished up again all drunk. <laughs> Yes, we drank nearly the bottle, and it was pretty full, and the bloke said to him, give me that bloody bottle of rum. He said, I'll fix it. So he took it away, and I don't know what he did with it. But when he came back, he gave it back, and by Jesus, I think he must have put some bloody... Uh, Terps in it. Oh, <laughs> Terps. <laughs> I don't know what's in it. No, he had probably had some moonshine yeah. and put in it. Gee whiz, didn't it knock us? <laughs> I remember uh, we had a, a ride home on a motor car. The driver was going all over the bloody road. And we get back to the camp and uh, it must have been bloody near daylight. It must have been. Uh, because we had a creek to go across to get to our huts. And uh, I manoeuvred, I was the sober of the lot. I didn't go in for drinking so much, but oh. Tom, at least Bill. Yeah. Uh, it's a phone. Yeah. He, uh, just he walked keep, across. I'll just keep, come well, back. Keep, keep telling that tale, or yeah. if you can remember it. What, yeah. happened, what happened after that? Oh, well, um, we got back to the, on the road. We were some distance from the camp. We had to cross the creek. I remember Bill walked across from the stones, and he said he got across dry-footed. Yeah? But Jack Dolphin, oh, he's in a bad way. He, um, he's drunk for three days. He must have been drinking plonk too, and every time he had a drink, he's drunk again. Yeah? And he's just lying under a tree there holding his head. Oh. <laughs> he died after, he's rotten. <laughs> <laughs> there must have been some good moonshine then. Another episode there too, Alan. Uh, one of us had been into town, and those places you didn't come back with a bottle of beer. You had to have rum or whiskey or something like that, concentrated. Yeah. Otherwise, no good. Couldn't you know. carry it. So I used to usually buy, bring back a quarter of uh, rum. It wasn't beer at that time. Yeah. So anyhow, one of these times, there was a bottle brought back. And of course, we got stuck into it. And I wasn't too bad. I never did drink a lot. You know, I was always a sober one, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. But Bill and Jack Dolphin, oh, didn't they get drunk? <laughs> <laughs> And they get rotten drunk and they decided to go up the creek, up the valley a bit and where some other bullies were and give us some of the good stuff, you know, uh -huh. get them drunk. So we started off. We were carrying a lantern. I don't know who was, I think Bill was carrying a lantern, a hurricane lamp. It was pitch black, you know. Uh -huh. No street lights. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to drive, go across the dry bed of a creek, not far from where our camp was. And the top, where we crossed, there was a, had been a water hole, but it was a dry time, it was all dry, and big boulders and that in it. Anyhow, going across this place, they staggered sideways and got into this place and fell down, and the lamp went out, and they <laughs> in the pitch black night amongst this dry water hole. Yeah. And it was left to me then to rescue them. <laughs> I remember I got Bill, and I got him back to the camp and put him to bed in a drunken stupor. Yeah. And Jack Dolphin, I had a bit of trouble with him too. I got him back, dragged him outside his humpy, and put his head on the saddle that was there and left him and went back and got Wilson. He's the worst. I got him back and I shoved him into the into his hut, you know, gave him a push at the door and he went under the bed. 
<laughs> it was flossing to the floor. And here he is under the bed and he's struggling to get up and he said, this bastard <laughs> won't let me up. <laughs> he scrambled out and he could see the hole in the wall where the window was. Eh? He said, I'm on a bloody boat, that's where I am. <laughs> anyway, I left him there in the morning and they sobered up then. Yeah. Uh, I never forget that, the blokes up the creek never got any rum. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's certainly um Yeah. And that the um the idea of entertainment then was really um so at night yeah. or in the weekends. Yeah. Uh I think you said that before, you used to go around kicking jam tins to see if you could read the label oh, and yes, things like that. Yes, but yes, I mean yeah. you didn't really have much to do but talk to one another, I suppose. No, no. Oh I know um Sometimes we'd get visitors out of the bullockies, you know. Yeah. We'd sit round, we had a, a galley, I suppose it'd be about uh, eight feet each way, you know, with a fire on it. Yeah. Galvanised iron. And uh, these old bullockies get to talking bullocks. The relative merits of the various bullocks they had. Which is the best one? Which is the best poorer? And this brindle would be a good one to put in the old scarlet and this sort of thing, you know. And sometimes, They'd get into, they'd have a few rums in them and they'd get arguing the point and there'd be a bit of a fight around the fireplace. Yeah? Yeah, they were bloody bullets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hard cases. Oh, gee, yes. Yeah. Hmm. That was off and on when they had boosters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, as you said, I mean, Jack Dolphin was, um, was particular about, you know. Oh, he's was very fussy about his team, yeah. yeah. He had to have the biggest and best. Yeah. Yeah, the biggest and the clumsiest, incidentally. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Jack was very keen and he liked his wagon nice, you know, and things like that. Hey, name the wagons, you know. Yeah. Oh, yes, they uh, put names on them. Yeah. But, oh, name of some girl or sometimes a nailed after ship or anything, you know. Yeah. Yes. Now obviously then, in those days, it was very similar to the, the great big trucks of today. So yeah. you'd have, you know, someone who drives a semi-trailer today has a name on it. Yes. And they, some of them polished them up and put things all over Yeah, them. yeah. Same sort of thing. Yeah, same sort of thing. Oh, yeah. yes. Some of them had ragtag equipment and some had good equipment, you know, look after their gear. I know Jack Dalton was very fussy about his bullock yokes. Yeah. I made his bullock yokes and had to order nicely polished and sanded down. Yeah. Matter of fact, I made a one oak for, uh, yoke for him out of uh, mountain, mountain oak. Yeah. And beautifully grained. Rubbed it down, polished it up, you know, and put it in his bullets. Yeah. And uh, he liked them finished properly, you know. Especially uh, bullets at the back of his team. The polers, they had to have an extra wide yoke, so to sit down their necks, they had to carry the weight of the pole and that, you know. Yeah. And so it'd be good for them. Oh, yes, oh, I'll say that of Jack Wilton Dalton. He's very careful. You see, some of the gear some of them had on us, they wanted to me the bullets could pull it all. Yeah. Because they want a good yoke and they want the bows properly set so they can pull into the bow, under into the yoke. Right. Some of the poor buggers, I don't know how they were pulled. Right. Cruelty. Just didn't care. Yeah. And the bows had to be the right height, you know, so they wouldn't choke themselves. Yeah. Pull it up too high to get them around the throttle. Mm. Oh. Oh, I know. I was surprised one day. I was up in the bush and unhauling out a log, and I stopped down in the gully. The log up one side, and the bullocks going up the other side. Yeah. And I could see the bullocks flopping down one after the other, and I thought, what the dickens is wrong? And I woke up to the fact that the chain was tight and it was up under the bows were up under their necks and were choking them. Passing out. Them. Mm. Yes, so I had to back all the bullocks and get them get their best before you could get them on the feet again. Oh. Yes. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, the wagon I had from Dalton wasn't too bad, but I had a lot of. Uh, um, scrub bullocks, I suppose you could call them, you know. Yeah. But they were good pullers, yeah. my word. 
I were they were good. Air shears are usually good. They're cranky, but they're good pullers. Yeah? Yeah. See one going up a high, a steep place, and he'd be grabbing tapes of grass with his mouth to try and drag it <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yes, and sometimes I'd pull my heart and me and all bullock through the bow, you know, and only that butt's behind the bow, the, the blooming yoke. The rest would be shoving through the bow. <laughs> I suppose that there are stories like that that came out of the bullocks, uh, bullock drivers sitting around the fire. Oh yes, yes. The stories that get a little bit more lavish, uh, you know, lavish and uh, elaborated. Oh the yes, they oh, told some them. of them very proud of their bullocks, you know, and yeah. they reckon they had the best teams and the best pullers and wish they could have a scratch pull and things like this. Yeah. Oh, they told me this Jack Wilson up the Tweed, he had uh, bullocks and the. Uh, they used to hook their teams together and have scratch pulls with the bullock team. Yeah. Yes. That's a lot of them will break their blimmin' necks if they get back to the front and the bow. Yeah, bust You know, them. if a bullock, uh, sometimes they get round and get round the wrong way and the bow, a yoke turns upside down. And by hell, it's a job to get them out of it too. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to unyoke them. Oh. Another thing, you've got to be careful with a team of bullocks. If you let them stand, especially in a hot day, and the, the leaders can come back along the, the team and they sort of form a ring, yeah. and the leaders go up and they can't get out. Oh, yeah. See, they're, they're fenced in with the other bullocks. Yep. And if that happens, the chains all get tight and you can't do a damn thing. You can only unyoke them. Yeah. Yes, to save them, yeah. they choke each other down. Yeah. Yes. Well, they're very long, aren't they? You had um, as many as 22 bullocks. Oh, you? yes. Mm. And say a chain's about 20, 12 feet long, it yeah. covers quite a, a long area, you know. And especially in a hot day with Jack Wilson, these, these red bullocks, they feel the heat. Yeah. And if you're going across the creek and there's a water hole alongside the crossing, they'll make for it and they might get in, get in there and get drowned. Yeah. Oh, yes. My word. Yeah. yeah. So how the hell did you deal with that? Eh? You'd have to all unyoke them all and let them have a drink. Oh, no, just fetch them out of it and wait till they're unyoked, that's all. Right. Yeah. 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 There's a couple of stories, too, that, that while I'm thinking of it, the, that um, I've heard when I was a kid of, you know, those bullock yeah. stories about, um, that you used to tell us kids, you know, hoop snakes and... Oh, yes, yeah. Um, the house that covered seven acres, wasn't it? There's a oh, yes. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, that was one day uh, old Tom Baker and Ned Toohey were talking about big timber. And way down the south coast around Bega or somewhere. Mm. And uh, Ned Toohey was down there and he said this... Uh, Oh, some enormous tree down there, and I could see old Tom Bacon with a bit of a glint in his eye. And he put this one over about uh, this big tree, he said, and was felled, it covered seven acres. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> old Ned had bristled up. <laughs> and he said, it can't. He said, it did. He said, they felled it, he said. And it covered old wife and <laughs> his wife and five kids. <laughs> they split into slab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <gee. laughs> there must be a lot of those stories like that. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm. I know Jack Dolphin was going to the middle one day and there's a load of small logs on it. Sometimes you knock the bark off a tree and you've got to spoil it, although it might be small. Yeah. Because they only build good boards in them. And he had a load of these things on, you know, and he got bogged, and the wagon twisting the bullocks around to try and get it out. He upset the wagon and rolled it over, and all the logs get spilt, you know. The bloke comes along, he said, What are you doing? He said, I'm only getting the bloody count of the buggers, I forgot how many I had on. Another episode there. There's a, a horse pug. He came from around uh, Mullen Mimbiwa, I think. I think his name is Parrish. Mm -hmm. He went up there and he had a team of about eight horses. 
and uh, they wouldn't pull. Uh, joeys, as they call them, you know. Mm. They wouldn't pull. Why were they called joeys? Just well, because they're no damn good. <laughs> <laughs> they they wouldn't pull. Mm. But we had our own ideas about why they wouldn't pull. They weren't made, you know. Yeah. And one day he gets uh, stuck in the creek, and uh, there's high banks each side. She had been cut out, and high bank each side, and he he was stuck in the creek, and he couldn't get them to go. And he, we put up with it. Well, I wasn't one amongst them. I was there, but uh, he, I invited a, bullock, a couple of bullockies to go along and give them a hand. And one of them got on each bank in the high bank on each side and got busy with the bullock whips. Hey, bloody! <laughs> he went up the hill of the gallop. <laughs> <laughs> he, had to, he had to run out from stopping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I made him go. I thought a bloody thunderstorm would break over. <laughs> Well, they, they were very good with the bullet whips. Oh, yes. Mm. Although, uh, I never use a bullet whip much. Matter of fact, a bullocky, good bullocky doesn't, to say it myself. Yeah. Because you see a fella going on, he's flicking his bullets all the time. They get sort of used to it and they don't get hurt. Yeah. When you hit a bullet, you want to hurt him. Yeah. And then when you speak open there, next time, you yeah. take notice. It's best for the bullocks. Yeah. And not hit them with a whip either. Double the whip and give them one along the ribs. Yes. And it doesn't hurt them. But when you're flicking them, if you're flicking with the end of the whip and with the lash, you can cut pieces out of them. Yeah. My word, I've seen it done. Yeah. And it's silly, it's flicking all the time. Mm. I've seen blokes going along and shouting and cooing and raying and cracking whips and going on and getting nowhere. Yeah. It's a quiet fellow that does it, gets on. Yeah, because and when the bully speaks, then they know he means something, you know. Mm. And he, when he uses the whip, he knows he means business, mm. do, what to do with him, you know. Mm. I heard tell, though, the bullocks didn't understand ordinary English. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> if the one man's driving them all the time, they get to understand what he wants. Yeah. But if you start chopping drivers around and they give different commands, naturally they don't know what to do. Yeah. Poor buggers and they get a thrashing. Mm. Yes. I see many times I felt sorry, terrible sorry for bullocks sometimes, yeah. the treatment they get. Yeah. Poor wretches. Because they're just like people, they are. Mm. Yeah. There's some uh, docile and some cranky and some will plod along and on. You think they're working hard and they're not doing a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Just passengers. <laughs> and there's others pull them for their lives all the time. Yeah. Yes. But if you've got a bullock that pulls hard all the time, you can't put another wood in because they'll kill each other. Yeah. So if you put your good puller on the off side, which pulling all the time, and put a bloke on near you, that it'll pull, but he, only when he's told. Yeah. And it's easier for the bullock. And the bullock that pulls all the time then doesn't. Well, he's it's not straining himself because the other bloke's not pulling against him. Right. You understand what I mean? So it swings the yoke back and forth. Yes. So when the one that pulls hard, yes. the other one that's alongside him's got to pull hard. Yes. Oh, I see. And if you want a bloke on the knee, it's, it's easy to tune him up to make him pull if you want to get stuck. Right. But see, it's the main thing of the team. Is to get them all to pull together. Yeah. It's no use having a lot of bullocks and they're not pulling together. Oh. So you've got to learn how to get them all to pull, to pull together. Oh. And you got to be a beat then. So when you when, so if your team is there and you've got a load on, mm. and how do they actually get the load going? Oh, you straighten them all out first, yeah. and then you sing out to them, crack the whip. Right. And they get to know. And they just all lift the chain at the yeah, same time. Yeah, they all the same. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And how long are these these um, poles that the pole the, the pole ones? Is that what you call them? The, the polers. Yeah. Oh, well, there's a pole in a wagon. Yeah. And it's a bit more than the length of the bullocks, you know. So it runs the whole length uh, of, of a bullock. Oh, yes, yeah, the whole length of the bullocks, and it's hooked onto the the start ring of the yoke. Mm. The start ring of the yoke fits over the end of the pole and you put a pin in, you know. Right. 
And uh, of course, it's what they call the tongue. At the end of the pole, it's got a oh, round piece of iron, you know, around the end to hook the hook in for the rest of the bullocks, the rest of the team. Yeah. Bit hard to get to understand, I suppose. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, and that, that reminded me too of that, if you could describe how those, you know, remember on that photograph of Grandad Hayward, yeah. and that, that had that um, tie-down method with the two poles, what was yeah. that called? Oh, well, it was a roller twitch. Or a roller. A, yeah, or a, you can twitch with the bar, just a simple thing, you know. Mm. Now how did that work? How did the roller twitch work? Oh, well, um, you got your chain across the load, not too tight, mm. but you put the roller alongside with parallel with the chain. And then you get a, a lever and put over this roller and under the chain and you wear, bear down on the other end of it. Right. See? And yeah. you bear it down and it pull the chain tight. Right. So is that, how did they end up with those two poles sticking up in the air above the load? those poles, so... Oh, well, he probably had two twitches, two roller right. twitches on. So that they, they, was, they were going upwards, yeah. those rollers. Yes, they weren't pulled right down. There's no need to because the chain must have been fairly tight when he, before he started to twitch it. Right. So it just, it's pulled down like you'd pull down yeah. a, like it's a like, a, like you're lifting into the lever. Yeah. That's the man, the same sort of thing, you know. Right. So they must have been very tight when you had them on there. Yeah. And then you just have another rope or another chain on that to hold that down. Mm. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, you see them down when you're on it, yeah. doing it. I yeah. would. Yeah. I think you said once that you had a dog that was actually run over by the the whole of that the empty wheel wagon, empty wagon. Yeah. He lay down in front of the wheel while he stood in there stopping the yarn and he started up his bullocks and pulled the lemon wagon wheel over the top of him. Oh. <laughs> he didn't yeah. kill it. Yeah. No. I don't know Surprising, because it's a bloody, they're big wheels, aren't they? Oh, they're heavy. Yeah. You can't lift them. Well, you might. Yeah. It's a very heavy wagon wheel. Yeah. I don't remember the word. I know, and we greased the wagon, we never lifted the wheels off. You put a wallaby jack under it and lifted the whole lot up and just pulled the wheel off the axle, axle not right off. Uh -huh. And greased and then shoved it back in again, see? Right, just yeah. slide it in. Yeah. And you'd have to carry all that kind of stuff with you everywhere you went to make sure you could... Oh, yes, you always took the wallaby jack. If you yeah. went out of the wagon, you always put it in the tray in the back of the wagon, you know? Yeah. Most of them, that's what... Uh, the strength in the, 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 uh, the front of the back portion is what you call the petrol as they come on like that onto the pole. Yeah. And they uh, usually bit a tray there to put all your equipment on to spare oh, a train and, or yeah. a rope and a jack and things like that yeah. to carry them. Oh, it was always wise to take a jack with you when you had the wagon, yeah. Mm. And do you ever sort of have any problems where you'd, you'd go sideways and you break a wheel or? Did you oh. No, I've never had anything like that. I did hear about uh, a bullock. He he, uh, he run around a tree and bent the axle, the back axle. Oh. And uh, what he did, he got two small logs and put across the, the road and pulled the back wheels up on it. And when he got them there, he put the, what you call a tom or a piece of timber under the back, under the logs, and propped them up, uh, see? And then he locked the logs from under the wheel, and that meant his wheels were free from the ground. Yeah. And then took the wheel off, and did the nuts that held away the axle to the axle bed, dropped it down, uh, and took it out, heated it up, and belted it pretty straight to the back of the axe when it was red hot, you know. Uh -huh. And I, I, I was told he dug a hole in the ground first for the axe and when, it, he, uh, when he did all this, he rolled the, the axle into it and covered it over and left it there to let it cool. I don't know what for. Tempering. Might have been tempering. Yeah. And then um, 
when he uh, got his road straightened and he managed to get the axle back onto the wagon, slipped the wheels on them, knocked the trucks out from under the logs, and they dropped down onto the road and away he went. Huh. You have to do what you can, eh? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah a... Well, there's no one, there's no NRMA to call, is there? Huh? <laughs> Can't exactly call the NRMA in. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Oh, sometimes it meets a tribute accident, but you uh, tear the pole out of a wagon, you have a go at putting in yourself and things like that. Mm. Yeah. What's the sort of working life of a bullock? Oh, well, I don't know. About 10 years, I suppose. Uh -huh. It all depends how they treat it, I guess, too. And it'd take you, what, a couple of years to train him properly, or? Oh, no. They get down the rudiments of the whole business in a few bloody weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you first get your bullocks, you uh, get them in the crush and put a, a strap around each bullock and attach a chain with a swivel in it you know, tie them together and let them run around like that for a few weeks. Yeah. They get used to walking around with a mate and it's half the battle. Mm. Yeah. And then you run them in and slap the metal gear on them. So there's, a, there's not sort of all the sort of nonsense that goes on with horse breaking or anything like that? Oh, I know. Oh, some, some bullocks break in fairly easily, but others are not. They bloody practice and contrary, and you might have a lot of trouble. Yeah. But uh, if you take things quietly and don't go mad and start bashing them and going on, yeah. I never had any trouble at all. Yeah. Matter of fact, the team I had uh, was the quietest team in the bloody place. <laughs> Everyone used to be a mile. I said I was the quietest bullock driver I've ever seen. Yeah. Because I was able to get in amongst the yard full of bullocks, and they knew their places. Uh, and a lot of them would, wouldn't need telling. They'd walk up into their place to be out. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. So they'd have, like, the third bullock along, whatever, they just lined yes, up? Yes, and uh, they knew their mates were uh, uh, going to work with them. Oh, yes, be surprised. Uh, yes. Of course, I say, there's cranky bloody bullocks, too. Yeah. Uh, You've got to watch it. Uh, they didn't have, you didn't have horn bullocks with horns, though, did you? Eh? They all had horns. They all had horns? Oh, yes. You didn't cut their horns off? No. Oh, oh no. Oh, no, you had to be careful if you yell, you know, see them swinging their heads about, they might trip them with your horn, but uh, most times they didn't do it on purpose, you know. Yeah. If they start doing it on purpose, you got to watch them. Yeah, also. One nearly got Jack Wilson, who's got his horn in his mouth. He yeah. managed to pull his head back in time, you know. Would have ripped his blooming mouth open. Yeah. Mm. The um, so y how long would that take you to actually, you know, to get the bullocks and put them in there in the wagon and on the on the oh, trains? Oh, about a half hour. Yeah. I could do it in a half hour. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It seems like a lot of regalia. Like when you when you when I hear about it, there's yeah. a lot of chains and a lot of things acting on. So when when the yoke goes over the bullock, that's a that's a big lump of timber across the top, yeah. and a metal bar that goes underneath there, under under there, there around uh, there. Yeah, the bow. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, the it's bow. not hard. Mm. What you do, you get your pair and you just lean over one bullock. You have your, your the yoke on your shoulder, one end of it, and the other end sticking out in front, and mm. you just lower it over the bullock you're close to you, and rest it on his neck. You get the bow in the other hand. And you just shove it up under his neck and through the holes in the yoke, yeah. put the pin in. And when you do him, you just lower the yoke down the bullock close to you and do the same thing. Doesn't take long. Oh. So oh you, get no. him, you get them in that first. Eh? You get them in that first and then the, you hook the, um, the chain onto the, yeah. the centre. And center when you get them yoked together, you just hook the chain into the start ring in the middle of the yoke. Right. And then you go to the next pair and do the same thing and hook, hook it up, see? And then there's, as you say, about 12 feet between each link. Oh, yeah, I suppose it'd be about 12 feet, yes. Of that big chain that goes yeah, through the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no difference, so it just starts from the front one? You start the front and work and you get the whole lot done. Right. Yeah. And then 
when you said before, I wasn't quite sure that the bar, the um, the the timber that runs out from the from the um, jinker. Yeah. Uh, how far does that run out? It doesn't run. Oh, it'll be about twelve feet long, I suppose. So just twelve feet. Yeah, somewhere around that. Yeah. It's, it's a long it's a job for me to remember that. Right. Point. But, uh, but that was a f like a four by four post, or oh, oh well, um, with a wagon, it might be four by four up at the end of it, but further back, it would probably be bigger. Yeah, you know. So it'd taper in. Yeah, taper out to taper the point, and then it'd have this uh, gadney, what they call a tongue on the end, just a sort of a steel strap went along the. The pole, yeah, and curved in the end, you know, right, just to, to hook into for the hook your team on, right, yeah, and so it really all pulled off that one centre chain, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, brakes of wagons usually in the back wheels. I've seen brakes in the front wheels of wagons too, but it's not a hell of a success, yeah, because uh, I've seen it done. I see a bloke uh, whack the front brakes on and the front part of this thing stops and the rest comes, keeps coming behind and the, the pin, the king pin as you say, that uh, revolves in the front, uh, you know, for a turn. Oh yes, yes. It would uh, pull right out if you're not damn careful. Oh. Yeah, you got to have a pin in it and it'll jump right out. Well, if you put it on the back wheel, it's, it's none of that trouble at all. Right. Yeah. You want to put the back one on first. Yeah. If you got two brakes, but most of the woolies only had one brake in the back wheels. And you ever have the occasion to actually drag a log? Huh? Drag a log down behind them to stop them rolling too fast? Down oh, the not in the wagons, but oh. coming out of the bush, that is often the case. Uh -huh. uh, if they had what you call a truck, just a pair of wheels and hook the log on behind. Yeah. Going down steep places, you drop the log right onto the ground. Right. And steep places, they'd lock the wheels of the blue and jinker, uh -huh. chain them so they wouldn't turn, and uh, put a heavy chain around the log. To get traction on it. Yeah, catch to it. catch in the ground. Mm. And drive a dog in it so it wouldn't slip right off, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it'd just slip off the end of the dog. Yeah. yeah. And they were quite slippery, weren't they, the logs? Oh, fine logs are very greasy when they're freshly cut. Mm. Yeah, very slippery, mm. especially wet days. Like, yeah. So when it when it got a bit wet, you you'd um, you'd bog very easily, then, wouldn't you? Oh yes, all was wet at all. It's up to unyoke. Can't can't work in the rain mm. very well. Anyhow, it makes the bullocks next shore when they're working in the wet. Does it? Yeah. Oh. I wonder why, why, what difference that would be. Oh, chafing, I think, Adam. Just, just uh, the the water. Movement of the yoke on the on the necks. Oh. Chafe. Would that give them trouble normally too? They, they. Would you do any treatment for them or? No, no. They just get, get right. That's all. Yeah. But we didn't happen to happen because we didn't work in the wet. Right. Yeah. Unless it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. Anyhow, it's too dangerous working in the wet. Yeah. So when you're going along roads and things, they they didn't have any shoes or anything, did they? No, no. Oh no, uh, unless uh, well, most of the places up there where we were was only dirt roads and mm. no gravel roads much. No. Only uh, just in the dirt. Yeah. Mm. Uh. So that's that's the big difference between them and horses, wouldn't it? The horses have to be shod. Oh yes, they've got to be shod. Yeah. Oh, I believe there is places where they have to shoot bullets, but we never had to. Ah. Oh. No, none up there. Yeah. So it was there. quite possible to shoot bullets. Oh, it's always to shoot bullets, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Um. What well, do you want to break for some lunch? Huh? You want to? Have a break or? Oh yes, I don't care. Um, no more questions you want to ask? Fred? Oh, I've got heaps of questions, but um, I'm just wondering whether you, you know, I'm overdoing it or. Oh, I can go for another while if yeah. you like. I don't care if there's any more to ask. Um, well, it occurred to me before when I was looking through here that um, we've talked a lot about really uh, um, 
or how I say ancient history. <laughs> yeah. But um, what about the time when um, in Lismore, sort of after the war, yeah. when you're on the council, um, and what what happened then? I mean, uh, you were in Newbridge Street, and then you moved to to um, Union, Union Street. Street. Yeah. So I mean, in the in the almost in the space of my lifetime. So yeah, you wouldn't know anything about it, would no, you? No, no, no. So um, you know that. Oh well, when I went to the went to the war, you might as well say. Yeah. Uh, we lived in Woolumba. Yeah. But while I was away, your mother slept, shifted down to Lismore to be with the rest of the family. Right. That's how the country was there. And she selected the house and things like that, you know, to Newbridge Street. Mm. Oh. So she had to find that and get all the family. Yeah, get all the family there. By then there was... Nancy? Was Nancy? Not, not, no, no, before oh, Nancy. Nancy. Yeah, Nancy was there. She was only, uh, only a baby. Yeah. When she shifted to Newbridge Street. What, 42 or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So was actually in the war when you shifted to Newbridge Street? Mm, mm. Yeah, your mother shifted down. Yeah. Oh. Oh, it didn't matter anyhow because uh, work had finished up at Newbridge Street. It was useless being, you know, right into the, right at the end of the business and hard to get home. Yeah. I had a lot of trouble getting home when I was in the bridges even. Yeah. You know, I had to catch trains and so forth. Yes. When was, oh, well, it's getting on. I remember I was working out at uh, Piora and your mother was in Woolenbar. Mm. And uh, I had a lot of trouble. Oh, gee, I was dirty, working under the bridge all day and the dust was falling through and rushed off bolts and things and all the mess. So, managed to get a lift into casino to catch the train and I missed the train and I had to put the night in the casino and I was in a filthy mess I couldn't go to a pub I was too damn dirty yeah and there's only one person I knew in the casino I had an idea where he was in Canterbury Street wasn't far from the railway so I thought I'd go there and have a wash see if I could get a bath and clean up before I go to a pub <laughs> so I went there knocked on the door and his daughter came to the door and uh, asked could I see your father, Old, what's his name? Oh, it doesn't matter anyhow. Rupert, that's what his name. And he came out and he laughed like hell. <laughs> <laughs> he said, my daughter just came and told me there's a tramp at the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, he let me in and I said good night for Washington. Oh, yes. No hot water, cold water. Yeah. And they had a big tub and I gets in, you know, and washed myself. And uh, I got out of the tub and washed all the dirt out and got in again. Yeah. Second bath. Oh, gee, I was dirty. <laughs> had a second bath. Got cleaned up, ready to go. And oh, I said, no, you're not going anywhere, you're stopping here. Uh, so I stayed with him all, all oh, the night. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Slept in the bloody veranda. Yeah, I'll never forget that. Must have been nice and brisk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had a damn job to clean up. Yeah. Well, you could be surprised in the bridge how dirty you get. Yeah, I was thinking about the bridges. Um, you got started on bridges. Um, I remember you told us mm. in here. Um, was that from being... T you were you were a timber man. You got started on the bridges, or how did you start on the bridges? Oh well, um, I had myself down as a labourer. Yeah, you see. that's right. Yeah. And uh, I put myself down to timber man. Yeah. Or um, Ted Jones, the timekeeper of the main road, is the bloke that put me up to it. Yeah. Give me a job. That's right. Mm. Yeah, I recall that. Yeah. yeah. So that was in it was in Willumbar that you started on bridges. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm. And then you went through bridges in the war, still yes, making bridges. Yeah, building bridges, yes. And when the war finished, you finished building bridges? Oh, yes. Uh, well, I put me onto walls in, in Darwin. Right. And of course, when we come back, I was sort of in the public works. Uh huh. And they put me on building dips. Uh, oh. A chap called Ted Lowe, we had a gang, right. and they sent me with him. 
Yes. And uh, we went away down uh, around Wardell, I think it was. Uh, and uh, oh, I've heard a couple of dips with him. Yeah, I think that's right. I, yeah. I, I think we, yeah, we I did. Think we went that's right. Then. We talked about the dips. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just wondered what happened after Bridges. Mm. Um, did you work in, in Lismore on the bridges there at all? Yeah. On the south? Oh, yes, yeah, Robert before White? I went to the war right. with George Gould. Oh. I was on Lester Creek Bridge. We did work and then I did a bit on the other one too, over Wilson's Creek. So before the war, you worked on bridges in Lismore? Oh, well, it was before I went away. It was oh, the I war see. was on, if you understand, but uh, yeah. I wasn't caught up. Right. Yeah, but in Lester Creek Bridge, I was working there and uh, oh, we uh, put in some what they call cross girders that go across the bridge. Mm. that carry the girders, you know. Mm. Oh, he's a pretty good man, old George Guild. My word, working yeah. things out, yeah. Hmm. I wonder if you've, wonder if you described before, um, like the construction of a bridge. I mean, you, you've talked about the bridge work, uh, and you talked about blokes that have actually you 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 went to seek out to um, to learn about this stuff. Oh yeah. Because um, I remember you talking about that. Um, but. Uh, I wonder if you describe like the difference between a, a, a building wharves and building bridges. There must be quite a significant difference. There. Oh, well, um, the wharves we built at Darwin, there's no corbels under the ends of the girders, as mm. far as I remember. Mm. You know what a corbel is? No, I... It's I'd only short, about uh, 10 feet long. Mm. And it's, uh, it's put over the uh, headstocks, oh. five feet each side. Well, it gives us a girder that much place to sit on. Right, a, a kind of buttressing. Yeah, yeah, about five feet, you see, to sit on. Yeah. Otherwise, you're sitting straight down on top of the headstock uh -huh. without the cord. Mm. Uh -huh. And that's the main difference? Yeah. Uh -huh. I think that's the way it was done, and you forget, but yeah. I don't remember dressing any cords up or down at all. Uh -huh. And I was the job I used to do. Uh -huh. I think I just sat straight down on top of the headstocks. Oh. And so you'd just have these massive, were they, were they actually cut square, the timbers for, for the... Uh, on the wharves, yes. It was all squared, uh -huh. if I remember. And, uh, but on the bridges, they're round. Oh. Except sometimes the outside girder might be squared. Yes. Just but uh, matter of fact, I didn't mind them being round all the time because uh, you can cut the slots for the posts and everything before you put them in, you know. I used to. Mm. You know, the slot, you'd have to cut into a round girder to make so to stand upright. Yes. And I, I did all that. I surprised Wally Nixon. I said, we, when we was working on uh, a bridge there in North Lismore, you know, the one over the bridge, the one over near the uh, dog track? Yeah, yeah. Well, we put in a girder there. Is that the Robert White? No, not the Robert White. It's on my end of Moldwood Street. Eh? It goes along down to the low level bridge that was there. It's pulled down now. Oh. Pulled down now, but there's a bridge there. And oh. I, I uh, fixed the girders. I cut all the slots for the posts and bored the holes for the bolts and everything before eh? it went in. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> and we just put it in place and it's able to pop the bolts in right. Oh. That takes skill. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It's getting through round timber like that and actually measuring it is very difficult. Yes, yeah, chalk line. Yeah. So you just fire a chalk line down it. Yeah, and get the straight. And, and get a centre your, line. Matter of fact, when you build a bridge, you build be a centre line. Mm. Yeah, you put a line straight down the centre and you take all your measurements off that. Right. Yeah, because you'd be buggered otherwise, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. The same with the log. If you want to square the end of it or anything, yeah. you strike a line down the middle. Right. That's where I had an edge on a lot of those blokes up in Queensland mm. because they didn't know. Mm. But right. I use this. Yeah, the old noggin. Yeah, it's certainly a difficult thing to do to get it. Yeah, so one difficulty you had is old Herb Harris, he's a real master in the job. Yeah. And I always tried to get working with him, but I never could for the simple reason that I picked things up quick myself and I was given a couple of blokes to work with me and I was kept away from old Harris. 
I could have found out a lot of things quicker. Uh, yes. Uh, well, Lord House is good. I, he, uh, when I was sent up north, he was sent down to uh, build a bridge uh, down uh, on the Dorigo somewhere. Mm. And uh, it was a bit awkward. And the engineer came along and old hell asked him how to do it. He said, how do I do this? And they didn't know. No. Uh, so I um, did it. Uh, he worked out himself. I uh, know oh, we went to work down uh, between Casino and Grafton during the war. Uh, they had to fix up a bridge in Myrtle Creek. And the old girl come to me and he's laughing like hell. He said, you know, these bloody en engineers don't know a thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, he left it to him. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's not all that surprising. <laughs> yeah. no, I didn't know. Yeah. It's all right. They could draw the plans and everything. Yes. Everything nice and straight. Yes. <laughs> That's the trouble, isn't it? It's all <laughs> nice and straight in the plan, but everything nice and straight. But the you're gonna, not. If you've got a gear that's got a bend in it, and you've got to work it in to give it the most strength, yeah. and things like that, yeah. you got to work your head. Yeah. Um, I remember you telling me years ago too about things in Darwin. I don't know whether they're all in here. I, I, um, I'll have to read through it again. Yeah. You remember from the other day how much of uh, Darwin, about Darwin is in here? There's, no, um, I don't get very really much. There's not much. No, and no. You had quite a lot of stuff about Darwin and, and air raids and, um, and the mm -hmm. Yanks and um, so there's a lot there that we could deal with with Darwin. Um, if you are mind to, I mean, if you want to break and, and talk about it afterwards, well, that's all right. Yeah, I can talk about it after I'm trying to think about a bit of it, what we first did. Hmm. I know we built a new jetty first. Uh, an L-shaped one went straight out and in parallel with the beach. Oh, yeah. First one we built. Pretty rough, too. Hmm. I suppose they had to be then. Yeah. Just to get them quick. Yeah. And uh, then we had to fix up another one of that old cast iron piles. Uh, and uh, the Japs blew it in pieces, in two or three bits, and we had to join them all together. <laughs> cast iron piles? Yeah, iron, yeah, iron piles. Mm. Yeah, how'd they last in the sea like that, though? I don't know, they seem to be all right. Yeah? Yeah. Oh. Well, I think they were cast iron. That'd be something. <laughs> I guess Metal. so. Metal. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, some of the bridges we did was uh, fairly quickly built, but uh, in other places, when they meant to last a lot longer, had to get a lot more trouble. Uh, for instance, these wharves in Lismore. Hmm. All those piles were sheathed in copper. Yeah. Yes. And copper bolts. Oh. Yes, things like that. Hmm. Even that bridge I was telling about putting that girder in, uh, all the piles have been sheathed in copper. Yeah. And city bass have been going along trying to tear the copper off, you know, pulling out the clouts and home, ripping the copper off to let the copper in. Yeah. Oh, it didn't do it in purpose. I wanted the copper sheathing, I suppose. Yeah. It, uh, it's silly. People do things. Uh, yeah, well, the wharves are still... I mean, there's, there's a few wharves still there at Lismore, aren't there? They've fallen down. Oh, uh, yes, uh, I think they're starting to pull them all out. Are they? Yeah. Because I used to play in them when I was a kid. Mm. No, pretty, pretty... There's a bit of a scheme going on in Lismore now to clean up the river bank. Oh, is and it? they're cleaning up a lot of that sort of stuff. Oh. Matter of fact, you got the thing on? Doesn't matter. Oh, it is. Yeah. But yeah, uh, the river itself, they're thinking about altering the course of the river. Were they? Yeah. Oh. Um, and uh, cutting Leicester Creek, you know, going out toward Leicester, going uh, under the railway line, mm. and enter the river down to Gundrimba. Oh. Make a new, new stream there and fill up the river back where it is. Really? Yeah. From there down to Sue Lismore 
to the Jackson's Wilson River, fill it all in. And then they can build it. I mean, no danger of bloody floods eating away to back, you know, Frank Street, yeah. those houses. Yeah. All that will be done away with. Oh. And they'll have a lot more of this more. Oh. If they can get this other scheme moving. Well, it might be a good idea because that water from Leicester Creek won't go into Lismore at all. Yeah. The bypass yeah. Lismore. And mm. See, uh, very often there in flood times, Leicester Creek comes down and stops the Wilson Creek River from running out. Right. You know, yeah. they choke there. Yeah, they do. It's just at the junction, yeah. and it's a bad place. The water can't get away. Mm. So if they can do that, it'll give the Wilson River an open slather to get away. Mm. And uh, the Leicester Creek will run in further down the down towards Gundarimba somewhere. Mm. There's a bloke proposition to whether I carry out. It seems a good idea to me. Mm. <laughs> you're right, you you're a, look a bit tired, yes. Dad. Yeah. Yes, um, we often got uh, air raids, you know, mainly in moonlight nights. Mm. And uh, of course, we used to hop into the shelter into the trenches and so forth. And uh, I remember one night we headed for these, uh, uh, what, a trench we used to get in was uh, shaded under some trees, under some bushes. And uh, a friend of mine, he didn't get down into the trench. Well, I was there, I was just sitting on the edge. And he had a rustle behind him. And he pulled out his torch. He wasn't supposed to, but he did. You see what it was, not a bloody great snake. Yeah. We killed it, it was six foot eleven. A big brown one. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, this other time, um, the raiders in, in daylight had happened, one Sunday. These Japanese planes flew over. Uh, Mishibishis. Oh. My mate, he'd been in the army and he knew all the different types of planes, the Mishibishis. Fighters, it was armed with machine guns and such, and they didn't, did their camp over. Oh. While the bombers flew ab up above. Yeah? The bombers were up above, 15 bombers up above, and these Mitsubishis at ground level, I suppose, to try and silence any gun that fired at the bombers. Yeah. But uh, anyhow, um, we were heading for the uh, shelters, and uh, McDonald. He was running along and uh, this kangaroo we had, it stopped suddenly and Mac ran over the bloody top and fell all over the place, you know. He told everyone he, he uh, overtook, overtook the uh, kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. oh, it was pretty tame, the old rear. We used to sleep alongside my bed yeah. every night if I wanted to get up. I'd have to be careful, I'd put my foot on him, stand on him. Yeah? Yeah. One night he rang me up, woke me up, he was over, uh, hovering over my bed. He must have clipped him with his paw and woke me up. Yeah, very, very quiet. Huh. And uh, remember once your mother sent me some lollies, hard lollies. I gave him one of these and he put it in his mouth and he tried to get it on his jaws, you know, to break it and it slipped down his throat. You could see it go down and he'd fetch it back up and have another go. <laughs> Until he finally cracked it and swallowed the bloody thing. <laughs> yeah. mm, I don't know what become of him in the punish. <laughs> uh, yeah. I didn't think kangaroos were like that. I thought they were, you know, less less likely to be uh, very friendly. Oh, this one was. Yeah. Very, very peaceful. Oh. Yes, uh, another Sunday there, the uh, Planes flew over. This is the time uh, the 15 plane Japanese planes flew over, and they bombed um, one of the airdromes inland. that flew over the top of us. There's nothing much to bomb where we were. You understand? Only mm. camps uh, after the bloody super fortress and things, you know. Yeah. And uh, I remember that a Spitfire flew up above them, and then he speared straight down through them. Yeah. Yeah. Flat out. But uh, I don't know if it got any of the bombers brought them down, but we got one of the, our boys went one of these Mitsubishis. Yeah. It was rifle fire. Really? Yeah. Um, he, 
Yeah, they threw over this, uh, I think it was a searchlight battery. And they opened fire with bloody rifles and happened to bloody well hit it and bring it down. Gee, that's lucky. Yeah. Because yeah. they, they fly so quickly, don't they? Yeah. Well, I remember quite well. I uh, went for shelter, couldn't get near them, didn't have time. And I lay down some wheel tracks. Yeah. That's about a, oh, eight or nine inches deep. Lay down on that. I bet the buggers never saw me. <laughs> <laughs> flatter than a snake. Yeah, flatter than a bloody snake, too right. Mm. Well, you said they were very low. Oh, they were very low. They just flew over and stopped at camp. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they fired a, the um, a trench we hadn't had occupied, just a buck of a hutch, and uh, it was a bit zigzag. Good idea too, but had a bloody bullet rolling right along the bloody trench. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Ah. But they uh, never never hurt anyone. They um, only put, put holes in the roof, roof of the cookhouse. Yeah. One of the cooks was handling a big dish of gravy and hit the bloody gravy and spilled it all over the place, <laughs> the bullet, and filled the roof with, the, with homes and uh, hit the truck. Never did the trucks any harm either. Punched a few holes, and the uh, military is very uh, interested because they're a new armour-piercing type of bullet they're using. Yeah. Yeah. They, we found some of the bullets and. A uh, new armour-piercing type of type of bullets that they hadn't used previously. Ah. Hmm. And they they didn't do much harm because no, they, they didn't. Just they did bugger all harm. And might as well stop at home. <laughs> yeah. Ah. I know you had a few uh, cannon shells and things when when you when yeah. you came home. I I got a couple of. Oh cannon yes, shells. they're kicking around somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's funny, you know, moonlight nights. They'd have searchlights going and all the rest of it, all any night, matter of fact. Searchlights going, but as soon as there's any Jap uh, alerts about the planes, Japs coming over, they used to never use them at all. Yeah? Mm, never use them. Or they were pinpointed where they were on the ground, I suppose that's the reason. Mm. They could follow the beam, you know. But uh, I believe some of our pilots had trouble because they were up there and they wanted to come down and they couldn't see because the searchlight used to blind them. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, bloody big searchlights, about six foot diameter. Yeah. The searchlights are big bugger. There's one not far from our camp. Oh. Mm. It's funny though, they didn't use them, isn't it? That they, um... Yeah. Hmm. Yes, uh... I well remember one night Jock Brewery and I we decided to go to pictures. There was a camp a couple of miles away, army camp. We had none, mm. no amenities whatsoever. We decided to take a shortcut and went through the bush. And we got a, this bloke there met us as we came through to the picture show. He said, where'd you blokes come in? Oh, across there. He said, you just walked through a minefield. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. So he didn't go back that way. <laughs> no? <laughs> They're not going to have another go at it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so pretty primitive, you know. The pictures are okay, but uh, the city ranges weren't much. I just had pork, pork sticks stuck in the, dug into the ground about so high, and poles from one fork to the other. That was the seat <laughs> and the pole. Of course, they only showed the one picture. Yeah. I remember the picture too, it was a good night Eileen. Ah. The night when we crossed. Yeah. yeah. I saw it in Darwin, I came home. A couple of months after and we showed in the screens in Lismore. Oh. Yeah. We saw it first. Huh. Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there must have been all that much entertainment, I suppose. There was just Oh, we had none. That's a, a drawback with the Allied Works Council. The C C C whatever you might call it. We had no facilities for amenities whatsoever. Yeah. The army had a piano and perhaps a place to write letters or anything like that, but we had nothing. Yeah. And uh, all we had was a gambling school. Yeah. Bloody gambling, that's how they used to fill in their evenings. Yeah. Uh, playing bloody two up. Yeah. They'd be playing till all hours. Bloody two up. I know one chap, um, he used to uh, do the whole lot, he'd get his pay and that night he'd blew the lot. 
Uh, and about it all. I said to him one day, I said, why don't you give it a while? I said, you're losing all your money. He said, one day I'm going to crack yeah. it. Yeah. One day I'm going to crack it. Oh, God.